name was? I always forget his name. Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. Yeah. His name is Robert Paulson. His name is Robert Paulson. <laughs> <laughs> Asshole Jitsu, I call it. Like, <laughs> Specialising in smothers and oil checks. And you know, like with the, this turtle guard thing. Like, people go, ah, oh, turtle guard. Oh, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, cool. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the guys, so I said, not only, not only am I going to make soap, but it's going to be better than defence soap. And they were like, you're off your head. Um, and then it started to be like, oh, by the way, my wife has been using this soap now for a month and it's, it's like cured her eczema. Now, that's not me saying it's cured for eczema, but this is what, what the feedback I'm getting. I, I think that um, a masculinity has been really sort of downtrodden, um, demonised in um, uh, modern society. I think a lot of blokes won't go home and talk to their missus because they don't want to worry their missus. And then all of a sudden they, they make themselves into a little emotional island and they can't talk to their mates about it because they don't want to look like a dickhead. Do you know what I mean? And, and then I think, I think that's why it's people that are, that are just topping themselves. Or hey, Good men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times, hard times create good men. So get your heart rate up, lift some weights, do some cardio, like get, get your heart going so you're gonna feel better on you. Um, I'm a massive believer in um, breath work and um, cold therapy. I think it's awesome. <laughs> so fact, we had this chicken in the hot tub with us, it was cool. The chicken loved it. Um, you had a chicken in yeah, the hot tub? Yeah, Jemima, Jemima the chicken. Um, yeah, he's having a great time. What, what belt are you? Blue. Blue. He's a two swipe white belt, mate. Watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You're a cunt. <laughs> Do you know what? But I've been grappling for like, when did I get into it? Like 2000 and, either 2007 or 2008. And um, just like MMA on and off. Cornwall, like, nev never go to schools or anything like that. Yeah. Just yeah. garages and stuff. Yeah. And then um, I only started going to um, actual lessons just before lockdown. Was it? Yeah. So then, uh, we, we rolled all the way through lockdown after like we had a month when we were trying to figure out what was going on and then we're like my mate was like he's got an old mum so he's like oh, I can't do it and then he got he got vaccinated and he's like right I don't give a fuck let's train so we just trained all the way through it and then uh, I thought oh, just start turning up to lessons again and they're like right they'd, and I was getting called a sandbag and I was like guys like yeah I've been training a long time but we train in garages yeah. and, and like do MMA and we, you don't give yourself belts mm. like especially not in a garage like well, where would you get your belt from <laughs> Sean's garage yeah I'm a purple belt now yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah. there's people doing that though aren't there is there fucking yeah. me there's I, people doing that yeah everything don't you kind of it's fucking hell right let's, uh, let's intro this in and then we'll get cracking Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast please like and subscribe to the channel today's guest is Mr Bassett aka Dan Bassett Hello. Hey, All right, how you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for coming <laughs> on, mate. Um, so uh, you seem like a fairly nice bloke, mate. So why do they say you're the most violent soap maker in the world? They don't know me. <laughs> uh, why do they say I'm the most violent soap maker in the world? Or is it you that says that? No. Um, so it was a bit it was a bit of like a tongue-in-cheek sort of um, claim initially because um, I started making soap, which we'll talk about how I got into all that. But um, I got goaded and goaded and goaded by my training partners into uh coming back and fighting again like coming back like i was some great fighter but having a fight and uh eventually i was just sort of, yeah yeah do you know what let's go for it at this point i was making soap and um i got matched up on raged mma and um meltdown mma a month apart i wasn't gonna fight uh basically i was re resisting all the sort of the the bait off my mates and uh I had about two incidents in one week where I nearly lost my rag. One was in traffic. Um, it, it winds you up, doesn't it? When people go off in traffic and like really aggressive because they are safe in their car and you're in your car. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then traffic stops and you're like, oh, well, you, <laughs> you change. Motherfucker. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, another incident outside, outside my house with a lorry driver who's being thoroughly reprehensible. Um, and I was thinking about giving him an attitude adjustment and then I caught myself and was like, God, oh, what am I doing? Um, phoned up, said, look, you've got to get me a, uh, got to get me a match up for, for this card, both to, um, Garrett Rage and, um, Paul Sutherland on Meltdown. Um, got matched up on both of them in the end after looking like I wasn't going to get either. Um, and then in the run up to, uh, fighting combat sports, UK magazine did a, uh, an interview of a few, few of the fighters on the card. For some reason they picked me. Um, and the, headline of it was uh 
Dan Bassett says he's the world's most violent soap maker. <laughs> and then, so I got hold of, I got hold of uh, Chris who interviewed me afterwards and I was like, what do you reckon? He's like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, but it came about because it's such a ridiculous claim because nearly everybody else that's making soap is a postmenopausal um, female, <laughs> which is probably taboo to say nowadays, isn't it? That anybody is actually female or, mm. or whatever. But yeah, so um, I'm probably the, the one sort of youngish, 42, um, Oh. Straight male making soap, so. Cheeky fucker, isn't it? I knew, I knew. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're a similar age, mate, so we're in good company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, worry. Actually, mate. Oh, fair enough, mate. Okay, yeah, it's not, uh, I guess it's not a, a hard uh, crown to get then, is it, these days? No, the world's most violent soap making now. It's very easy. Although there are some violent um, old women around, so. This is true. Domestic yeah. violence uh, stats. Yeah, probably. speak for themselves, mate. They do indeed. Um, so tell us about your background then. I mean, we'll come on to the soap in a bit, but what, what, you know, what did you, what, what's your background? What did you do before um, that? I've uh, got a few different hats that I wear. Obviously, um, I make soap. So yeah, grappling soap, that's me. Um, Cult Brand UK, which I've just started. Um, I'm an on-call firefighter back in, uh, back in Cornwall. Uh, and I, um, I work on a security team. Um, do have security jobs and stuff as well, but I've got sort of some regular clients and um, yeah, I'll do two weeks of the month sort of floating around and a bit bit here and there. And then um, the rest of the time I'm home making soap, Colt Brand UK and fighting fires. And uh, you ex-military, I think? Yeah, so um, I was actually Navy, yeah, um, in Plymouth, yeah. So yeah, I was a guzz rating on there, type 23s for, for a little while. Uh-huh. It, wasn't, it wasn't really me. I sort of, um, I got... Uh, Talked into joining up because I didn't know what I was going to do with my do with my life, and uh, my dad was saying to me, "Oh, why don't you go and join the navy?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, we'll do." Yeah, I went along just to shut him up. Um, sort of, th- I found the the idea of like the the mine sweeping stuff, doing a bit of diving or whatever, and um, sort of you know ordnance explosives all that sort of. I thought that'd be good. Um, from a fishing town, fishing family, so I was like, small ships would be good. Uh, it was back in the day when the careers office could lie to you. Uh, like outright lie to you and talk you into <laughs> jobs you didn't want to do and uh, they ended up convincing me to be a uh, comms rating um, which is like quite a technical job um, with like a sort of they've got like a base level of aptitude that you need um, and it's like it's hard to get out of the branch I think because there's um, you need a certain amount of aptitude but most people with with sort of the aptitude for that will be going for like artificer apprentice or officer and stuff so once they get you in comms they don't let you go so um sort of four and a half years later I was like ah oh, this is this is crap so I got out again um sort of floated around for a year or so 18 months um ended up going offshore uh that was okay I, you know saw some good places um did some interesting stuff then I got into driving boats which I thought would be my dream job because I, I always wanted to be a lifeboat when I was a kid so I left the when I left the navy I joined the RNLI did that for about uh, eight or nine years in St. Ives, um, crossed over with working away. Um, the boat driving was was good, but I was working on the wind farms and um, the technicians we were faring around were like miserable bastards. They're always dripping and I can't be around miserable people. Like they, they just sort of take me down. So then I was like, what am I going to do? Um, I kind of flirted with the idea of getting into um, close protection, doing security. I was, sort of do, I was doing loads of door work and all that sort of stuff at the time, but I was like, oh, mate, could I get into this? I don't know being ex-Navy because it's real sort of um, dominated by sort of the Marines and the Paras and SF and, and um, you know, CP sort of land side more like the Army. Um, so anyway, I thought, oh, I'll think about it. My missus came home. I'd only been, been with her for about uh, three months, bless her. So she came down to my place one night and she said, you're miserable at the minute. Um, go, and do, go and do that course you're looking at. Um, I said, well, I can't really afford it. And I don't know. She said, you'll be good at it. You're miserable now. I haven't known you that long, but you're not meant to be miserable like you are. I can tell that. Um, I've put enough money in your bank to cover your rent for the month. Go do it. So I can know she's a bit of a keeper, this one. So <laughs> it's fucking nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so, Jesus. so married her, yeah. Um, in the end, yeah. She's <laughs> there, there and snapped there. her up. I'll like, marry that one. No, she's, she's lovely. She's beautiful. Um, got two kids, so it's all good. Been, I need to give like what? 14, 15 years now, something like that. Um, so yeah, went off and did a CP course with absolutely no contacts, very little experience in, you know, that crosses over from a Navy. Um, just thought, go and do it. And um, sometimes you've got to back yourself. Spent about uh, 15 months, 18 months, just sending out emails, pestering anybody we knew who was like, any, anywhere near CP. Um, and then 
funnily enough, the um, Somali pirate thing was all kicking off and was all in the press. And I didn't really, I hadn't heard about it. Um, and a company got back to me and said, oh, if you, you can drive boats. Yeah, yeah, I could drive boats, yeah, because we are on lie tickets, all that sort of stuff, because the helmsman on, on their crew there. Um, they're like, right, come and drive a gunboat for us for a little bit. So that got me into the industry. So went out to um, Djibouti as, you know, pe people that have sort of done this will go, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, got out to Djibouti, did a bit of work out there, freelance for a little bit, and then eventually I got into a firm uh, that was a really, really, really good firm. I spent about three years with them. Uh, it was really good. And then you could see that, like, you know, the writing was on the wall with it a little bit with the rates coming down because, you know, like Russians and uh, Indonesians and Filipinos and, and whoever else would do would do the job for $100 a day, you know, and we were on like $400 a day or whatever it was, um, door to door. So the money started coming down like, you know, oh, your travel days are now half days or, oh, it's, you only get paid X amount in theatre, you know, until you get to theatre. I was like, ah, and then that that kind of... I saw it, I knew it was coming and then it caught me off guard a little bit. And then my wife was eight months pregnant. We were in uh, Cairo. We were going to, going to um, Port Suez when the civil war was on out there. It was quite an interesting time. Um, we, weren't, we, we weren't in the trenches or anything. We were in the Cairo Radisson Blue like, on, on the roof going, oh, it's not, not quite hot enough to sunbathe. This is shit, you know. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, yeah, so, and the phone went off my wife and as, as I was going to take a, a transit and uh, in hysterics and I thought, I thought that um, it was problems with the baby because she was eight months pregnant. It was just the house had flooded that we bought a house, done it up and it had flooded. So I was like, that was a bit of a sort of, bit of a nudge, like, do you want to be doing this? Because in a minute you're going to have kids and you're going to be, you know, we get, we go to sea and, you know, you, if you didn't have Wi-Fi on a ship, you wouldn't have any comms for like 10 days, apart from maybe an email. Mm. I thought, wow, do I want to be doing this? I managed to get back into UK working, um, on a temporary job, temporary job went on a bit longer. And then, um, picked up some really cool clients and I've been doing been doing sort of security work in the UK now since since then so over I don't know 11 years something like that mm -hmm. um yeah one of the rare matlows in um in uh, sort of short side security yeah so uh yeah that was how I got into all that happy days mate and have you got any uh, like mad stories from your time while doing close protection um no not in that really um Christmas day 2010 we were on on you know, like I said, when I got in, I was freelance for a little bit. Um, you know, eventually I got in, got in with that firm and they're a great firm. And, um, you know, I, was, I had a reputation by then, so it was fine. But um, when I was trying to get in there as a, as a Matlow, trying to get into um, security dominated, dominated and run by, you know, ex um, pool guys or, uh, you know, paras or whatever, it's hard going. So um, I was taking jobs and we took, I took some unarmed jobs, but I took a job where we were meant to be armed. Anyway, one of the lads came down to the cabin and was like, oh, mate, oh, Bassi, um, the guns haven't turned up. I went, what do you mean the guns haven't turned up? We had no free board. Like, it's the, like what makes you, like, mega vulnerable to, like, piracy is, like, A, the area you're in, low speed, low free board, i.e., like, you know, the height of the deck from the sea. Um, three main things, sort of, th three big things, anyway. Um, and we had all those things that were really bad, but we had guns, anyway. Um, I said, right, well, tell him I'm not going. He goes, mate, we pushed off about an hour ago. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and uh, we nearly got away with it, actually. It was when it was quite hot and um, there sort of loads of attacks going on. And we were coming into Djibouti on uh, Christmas Day 2010 and um, there were these skiffs turning out. And all we had was, <laughs> we got the, uh, the the chippy, the ship's carpenter, to, to, um, he got some templates of AK-47s and made them out of wood and painted them black. So we're going like this, like to these pirates, like, fuck off, like waving these guns. What, so they fucking come up and then... They come up, fucking... see the gun, fuck off. Because like, oh. that was that was what no everybody way. did because that was like, you'll see, like if you like Google it, like you'll see videos of, um, you put pirate attack or people kill pirates or guards kill pirates or whatever. You'll see like, there's American ones and Russian ones predominantly, but guys that are like waiting for the pirates to get up, and then when they get when they get like near to the vessel, they go over the gunnels like pouring fire on them, like just ah oh, yeah, like it's it's not my thing. It's not the way that we did it as British guys, you know. Um, and and there's a reason why, um, you know, even us lowly matlows um have a good reputation for for being professional. It's because um as British servicemen we we do things the right way wherever we can, and you know we would turn up, so the pirates would turn up. In the old days, they do hard approaches, so they come in and just spray and try and intimidate the captains. And you know, if the if sort of um, 
AKs didn't intimidate them. Maybe they'd have like PKMs or whatever, machine guns. Mm. And then maybe like RPGs and mm. captains go, oh, shit, stop the ship or they just carry on. Um, but then they worked, the pirates worked out that when more teams were having security, if they turned up with a hard, hard approach, hard attack, they would just get obliterated because mm. you've got, you know, a nice high stable firing nice platform, stable. cover, better guns, better trained. Um, so uh, then they turn up, they turn up with the ladders covered up and the guns turn up under tarpaulins waving fish at you. And yeah, so they turn up waving a fish, hey, you want fish? And we're like, no, fuck off, mate. <laughs> and then they would smile and we would smile and off they would go. And uh, yeah, so it was a bit of that. But Christmas Day 2010, they were just sort of coming in, being necky and we're doing that and they were pissing off again. And we were banging out maydays on the, on the sat phone and on the radio and everybody's ignoring you because under maritime law, if you acknowledge a mayday, you're duty bound to, to intervene. Mm -hmm. So we're like, mate, 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 and uh, nothing's happening. And all of a sudden, like eventually, like a Dutch warship and um, some Yanks turned up. We were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got hell. away with it. But it's like, you know, like make, make to mind at the time when I'd been in a while, little while, saying, oh, I'm thinking about taking some unarmed transits to get in. I'm like, Look, you know, I can't, I, I won't say not to do it because it's what I did because I had to do it. But if there's any other way, like, do, do the other way because you are rolling the dice you're rolling the dice whatever you do anyway it's, but it's like you're, you're narrowing down those those odds of something going bad then, mm -hmm. you know. do, they, do they just come on and rob you and then fuck off or do they, are they, so, do they fucking get the vessel what, um, the, crack of it? different parts of the world different robbery like the um, uh, the Malaysians the Nigerians have their own way of doing it they can they can both be like just come on and, and rob you or they can just be like murderous oh really um, yeah yeah over there they're really bad um, the Somali guys what they were they were initially set up to, it was like, they called themselves the Somali Coast Guard. So basically because, because it's, because uh, it's a failed state, there's no government. It's really rich fishing grounds. So you'd have like the Russian trawlers, Chinese trawlers just come in and just smashing all the fish. And then you'd have um, the, uh, people dumping uh, nuclear waste there as well. And like all sorts of shit in the sea. So the Somali guys initially were like, oh, we're, we're a Coast Guard. So they just basically get, got a load of AKs and they go off and then they took a vessel. Um, and, it, and it all went from there and then they realised there was money to be made and they would take vessels and there was one called like the MV Iceland where it was loads of Filipinos I think it was like 27 Filipinos or something and they were they were prisoner for years like years yeah because what they do is they take you and then the ship the contact the shipping company the shipping company um, will then pay a ransom the ransom gets dropped they get released so generally you get treated well um but different people have got different stories about it as well. Like, you know, I've never been captured by pirates, so, mm. so I couldn't tell you, but, you know, I didn't fancy it much, you know. I was about to say, fuck that. That's definitely how you want to spend Christmas, <laughs> no, is it? People, that, always, people will say, like, oh, no, it was just money, and do you know what I mean? And, and it was funded from Dubai, New York, London. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It was, it was a business. Um, yeah, it was, but also they were linked to, like, Al-Qaeda and all that sort of stuff, so you, you don't want to put your life in those people's hands, do you? No, all me. No, fuck that. <laughs> it was it was alright. It was interesting at times, and like anything, you 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 do a job that sounds exciting, and everybody thinks it's exciting, and it's like ninety five percent sort of drinking tea, looking out at sea, mm -hmm. um, a bit of excitement every now and then. But you don't get to enjoy the excitement because it's not a computer game. You're you're looking after people's lives and your own life and your mate's life. So mm -hmm. um, ultimately, so it's not like you know pirates turn up and you get to shoot whatever you fancy, and mm -hmm. you've got to be sensible and professional. So. Yeah, fair play, mate. So tell us about your sporting background then. So obviously you mentioned, um, just before we come on air, you did a bit of garage jits over the years. Yeah, garage jitsu, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, asshole jitsu, I call it. Like, <laughs> Specialising in smothers and oil checks. And you know, like with the, this turtle guard thing. Like, people go, ah, oh, turtle guard. Oh, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, cool. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> just slip the phone Don't up. You like, yeah. I'm going to like punch you in your kidney, punch you in your head, kick you in your ribs. Put my finger up your bum. Yeah, like, cool. How's your turtle guard? How'd you do? How'd you do? Isn't I'm, it? I'm good at turtle guard. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was uh, basically, I grew up playing rugby. It's like, you know, um, same as up this way, isn't it? You know, Cornwall's a, Cornwall's a sort of rugby hotbed, and that's where we grew up. My old man was a rugby legend locally. Um, grew up playing rugby with all my mates, made most of my friends through rugby, surfed a little bit, bodyboarded mainly. We're always in the sea, always on the beach. It's just what you did. You, you know, you, even if you like weren't a surfer or whatever, you just go to the beach. Um, and everybody sort of goes their own ways. But I stayed in rugby. I was a really small kid, like really small, really skinny, massive chip on my shoulder, like classic sort of Napoleon syndrome. Um, I was a scrum half in the school rugby team. But when we played, um, 
when we played like uh, for St. Ives, um, even like minis and juniors and stuff, I didn't have the hands to play scrum half, mate. I was on the wing, I had hands like frying pans. <laughs> so uh, be out on the wing, dropping the ball with, like every now and then when they throw at me, which is very rare down at St. Ives. Um, got disillusioned with rugby after like 19, I think, seasons of it or whatever as, as a mini and a, a junior and adult. Um, started doing a bit of uh, scrapping. I liked striking initially, like, who doesn't love banging, banging pads or hitting someone, you know? Um, started with that, went to see, see some kickboxing, found it a bit strange with the rules. I was like, what's the rules and they're wearing pads and stuff, not for me. Um, over at some mates talking about MMA, said, oh, I'll have a go at that. I was just winding him up, like, oh, yeah, I'll have a go at that, you fannies. Um, and then uh, my, uh, my coach at the time, uh, Ray, was at a seminar. He was speaking to uh, another coach and this guy said, oh, I've got this guy I'm training. He is nails. So Ray said, yeah, so have I. Yeah, he's nails. And uh, he goes, well, I've been training this guy six months. And, he, and Ray goes, oh, my guy's only been there three months. And he goes, well, he goes, I reckon he'd have your guy. It was just like a bit of banter. <laughs> then he come back, he said, do you want to fight? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll fight. And then I said, well, well if we're going to fight, why should we just fight pro? This is like, I don't know, what, 2000, 2008, 2009, something like that, you know? So it's still kind of early days. And um, Danny Cornwall, like, there's, there's nothing. So no one to ask about it, that you know? it was cage fighting. Yeah, though, yeah, it was it? cage fighting. It wasn't yeah. MMA, it was cage fighting. So, uh, so yeah, so... Um, and even then, I was conscious of the fact that like, there was a lot of people passing themselves off. Um, not a lot of people, but I was conscious of a few people that were saying, oh, I'm a, I'm a cage fighter. And then you go, oh, how many times you thought, oh, um, I'm not allowed. I haven't got a license because because I was done by the police one time. There's a lot of that. Or my coach says I can't at the minute. You know, like, oh, okay, cool. So I I wanted to sort of differentiate myself between uh, between those guys, and I liked um, who who was the who was the guy your uh, black belt? What's he called? Oh, Kenny Baker. Kenny Baker. That's yeah. it. Kenny Baker. He said he got into it because he wanted to be really hard. Yeah, like, one of the guys got in the I room. Can, I can respect that. Like, <laughs> it, like, everybody, go, why'd you get into it? Oh, I just sort of read a book about Henry Gracie one time. And I fucking yeah, I wanted to be really hard. Like, <laughs> so I got I got into it because I was I was bantering some blokes that uh, they both fought and were experienced experienced fighters and coaches and. Um, and I thought I was tough, you know, and um, I knew I was tough, I knew it was durable, I knew I was up for it, I was aggressive, um, but I wanted to see how I fared against a proper fighter. Mm. I wasn't aware of the the actual gulf and the levels that are in it, um, but that said, the guy I was, you know, fighting a guy who had marginally more expensive, uh, more experience than me, um, I was up for it, yeah, oh, he's meant to be tough, cool, so am I, brilliant. Um, 36 hours before the fight, after I'd sold like 400 quid of tickets to all my mates, the guy disappeared, done a runner. His coach was like, he's done a runner, he, sh- he shit it. So I was like, right, get me a stand-in. They were like, no, nah, no one will fight you. I was like, get me a stand-in or my head's going to pop off. Like, I was like, <laughs> And uh, so they were like, oh, no, the only guy I'll fight you at short notice is that, um, this is that pro, um, has had eight or nine fights and um, he's a really tough motherfucker. And I went, perfect, so am I. And they were like, uh. So, so that was it. So uh, I told this story before. So apologies to anyone that's heard it. Um, so t- we turn up. We turn up, and um, I didn't even cut weight either. I just fought the weight I was walking around at, which is a mistake anyway. So um, get there, and uh, the guy walks in, and two of my mates notice notice my fighter and his coach from the British judo setup. They're both both good judokas, and they're like, "Ah, oh, shit!" And uh, they they announce him, and he's like. Uh, Nine prof- ninth professional fight, um, background in like Roman Greco wrestling, wrestling, uh, jiu jitsu, judo, boxing, Thai boxing, whatever it was, right? And there, so everyone's like, yeah, from Exeter, like, yeah, yeah, and then they're like, in the blue corner, from St. Ives, and it's like, boo, <laughs> um, he's got, uh, it's his debut, and everyone's like, boo, <laughs> <laughs> like, actually, yeah, like, nightclub full of pissed up people in Exeter, and there you go, he's got a background in, and they were saying, like, before and I what's your background? I told them they're like, nah, I can't put that. I put put it down. They asked the guy whose event it was. He was like, if he says his background, so like, background in rugby. And everyone <laughs> just went quiet, could have heard a pin drop, and then everyone went, Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> These pissed up people in Exo thought it was brilliant. Um, got filled in by him anyway, sort of he got me an arm bar and I was so it was good because it was a good experience for me, it's a good lesson. Um, not necessarily a less lesson I learned from immediately, but um, you know. I went in there as a, in my head, like, a, so it was a fight to me, a street fight, you know, and um, this is against a guy that was sort of ranked in the UK at the time, you know, and uh, he just went like, ah, oh, fuck this, I'll take you down, got me an arm bar, I was going, break it, break it, like my right arm. Um, 
the adrenaline was so much. Um, and then I, I heard my corner shout, roll, roll. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just roll out of it. So I rolled out of it. Anyway, he gets me in a salivary and he's just beating me for like the rest of the first round. Um, and then like after four minutes, 40, because I told my corner, if it looks like I'm in trouble, don't throw the towel in, right? And they're like, yeah, okay. So I'm like in the salivary for like three minutes getting punched, right? And all I could do, because <laughs> the guy was taking it and I was so useless, all I could do was alternate between laugh, tell him to hit me harder. So I'd laugh, he'd hit me, he'd get pissed off, hit me. I'd go, oh, I'd go harder and he'd hit me again hard. And then I'd growl at him. And it went through this <laughs> little cycle. Um, the referee stopped it and I was like, I was looking at my corner like, doof, doof. I'm like, fuck, I'm like, going to throw the towel in or what? Like, you know, but they like took it really literally. My mate Mark took it really literally. So I got pounding. Um, that was my first fight. Um, so that would have been, actually, would have been Strength and Honor back strength then? Strength and Honor f- was it? five, I think it was. was. It? Yeah, Andy Costello. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had a couple of lads back in the day that used to fight that way. We, I don't know if you um, saw the episode with Steve Hollis that we did, and I was talking about the Kung Fu not, guy. Not seen that. Oh, no, I did see that. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah, was yeah. on Strength and Honor. Amazing. Yeah, fucking hilarious. It wasn't you, was it? No. <laughs> but I, I, saw Andy, I, uh, I saw Andy Costello on um, Russ Wait podcast, mm. and uh, I thought, I wonder. So I messaged him, because he said he'd been up and down and stuff. And I was like, hey, mate, you know, really good podcast. It was, it was awesome to hear, because it was really good podcast. And um, I said, don't know if you remember me. I'm the guy that announced himself as a rugby fighter. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I remember it. He's like, I'll never forget it. I'm glad you're still in, this, glad you're still in the game. And all this yeah, sort of still stuff. fucking breathing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that was my um, that was my intro to MMA, and my mates were like, do you know what I mean? Because it wasn't just like people I knew from the pub, or whatever. It was like my my mates, and yeah. they were like, "Fucking hell, that was rough to watch." And then we went, our oh, mate, so he went into it was like the arena nightclub or wherever it was, and uh, just just opposite is like a spa or a co-op or whatever. And we went in, and I wasn't I wasn't in bad nick, and my face was all scruffed up because you know like the, the stitching and stuff. Yeah. You know, like I'd been punched in the face for like best part of four minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, right by by a guy trying to like trying to get his uh, frustration out of me that I'm winding him up and stuff as best I could at the time. So I'm like red, black and blue. Anyway, this little kid comes up to me, I don't know, 15, 16 or whatever, and he's just looking at my face. He comes up, he goes, excuse me, he goes, what happened to your face? And I, I forgot about this till the other week. And um, my brother-in-law said to me, he kind of said, and said that, and uh, I just turned around to him like deadpan and said, mate, always wear a helmet when you're rollerblading. <laughs> 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 he just went, <laughs> and I bought like eight Stellas for my for my two hour trip back to Cornwall. Just got blotted in the car. Like yeah, yeah. So that was that was my right. first outing. Who did you uh, who did you find? Who was it? Um, so uh, a guy called Cy Phillips. Uh, I remember Cy. Yeah, you know yeah. Cy Phillips. Yeah, he was talk, was he talky lad? Yeah, fightworks. Yeah, whatever. yeah. So yeah, he was fucking. He was he was like a really early adopter of like MMA. Back yeah, then. he was good. I, I spoke to someone last week. You uh, you know mate of mate who I've got to know and. Um, uh, as I was on, he said, "He said, oh, it was your first fight? And, uh, you know, I said, he said, oh, no, I trained with him. <laughs> really? like, is he still oh, going, is he? Sword. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. ex-BJJ, ex, uh, apparently. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I haven't heard that name for years. He'll probably come out of retirement now and go on a podcast to <laughs> say how useless <laughs> I was or something. <laughs> the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, the guy's a trap. It's fucking mental, though, isn't it? Because you, you go into it thinking your art is fucking nails, and then as soon as, as soon as you go up against someone who's, who's fucking good at even jiu-jitsu or any, yeah. any of the martial arts... You quickly realise, fuck, I'm fucked here. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Even with someone who's like a rat, like you said, if he had a wrestling background, that must have been fucking horrible. If he had nothing, he didn't even need it, mate. All he needed yeah. was like, do you know what I mean? If he if he'd have been a two strike white belt, do you know what I mean? He could have just so used that, 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 Sorry, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a two strike white belt. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like like the uh, like a, a basic fundamental a takedown and some control and I would have been I would have been done um, which you know he had obviously far more than yeah. Um, but yeah but you know I came away from that one le- learning things about myself like A there's levels to MMA like um, B I knew I was tough because of, of you know I proved that I was tough um, it's not the way you want to go about proving you're tough but you know I come out of it with that but I also thought that I had no quit in me but then I did fight again another time and I got stopped with a body shot and really Body shots do stop you, don't get me wrong. But if someone had said to me, like, um, you know, like a sort of John Claude Van Damme film, like, oh, they've got your, they've got your little brother in or your kids in a room and they're going to kill him if you don't get up and fight around, you know, I'd have got up and fought around. It's, it's all in your head, isn't it? It's all the, the narrative that you're telling yourself all the time. Like we're talking about ice baths, like, mm. I'm going to get in the ice bath. You're going to get in the ice bath. Fucking, oh, it's cold. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And they jump out again. It's like, 
get in the ice bath now or I'm going to cut your wife's head off. They're like, oh, I'm in. Mm. <laughs> so it's all, it's whether you want to do it or not, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know, but fucking body shots are, can be fucking, uh, right, it's, it's especially, if, especially if you take a liver shot as well. They are. So this, if it's like, boom, like left, left, like right side. So this is, this is quite funny. Um, so I, it was when I was doing the, uh, the Maritime anti piracy and we were out in um, the Indian Ocean and we hopped onto Comoros Islands, which is like literally a crazy place. Like I'll never get to go back there again, I, I wouldn't have thought, but it's basically a volcano with a shanty town around harbour. It's wild. You can't go in the sea because it's, knob, it's like knobby central, mate. Sharks everywhere. All the trees, you can see spiders in the trees from like 200 metres because they are like that. Oh, like, and there's one... Honestly, I wonder when they're, mate. It's, <laughs> I hate spiders. I hate them. So there's one uh, hotel out there at the time, and it's probably more now, it's 20 years ago now, probably. Um, and it had Wi-Fi, so you get there, and I had a message, like, do you want to fight? And I was like, nah, no, nah, I haven't done any training. Ah, oh, wow, well, this guy, massive guy, he's like 110, 115 kilos, wants to fight. Said he'd fight any of our lads, and I was like, they were, oh, we thought you'd, uh, thought you'd won out. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. They're like, well, I was like, go on then. What were you wearing at this point? <laughs> uh, I was 82 bulking. <laughs> so, I was like, <laughs> so I was like, well, I can't fight him, he's that heavy. They're like, no, he's going to try and come down to like 100 or 95 or whatever. I was I'm like, still fair then, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, he's, there's no way, he's going to be like 110, 150 kilos. Well. I was like, yeah, okay. Um, get back to the UK and they're like, oh, um, he's pulled out. Um, don't worry, we got your stand in. I'm like, what do you mean, don't worry, you got me in the stand in? I didn't want to fight in the first place. It's only fighting <laughs> because of like the, the idea of it. So anyway, like, um, this is after like, uh, I don't know, I don't know how long I hadn't fought for at the time. Um, hadn't done any training, no cardio. Um, and uh, fought this guy, got 10 eights against him in the first round. Just, it was wrestling, but I didn't have any wrestling. It was just rugby. And um, tennis, second round comes out. I am knackered, right, already, because, like, zero cardio. Um, and uh, I, I went, like, I was looking for, like, a double leg. I was just having a rest against the cage. And uh, I, was, I was like this, and he's punching me in the ribs. And I'm like, Phew. I'm like, oh, great, right, okay, go on. I let him tire himself out there. Just punch me in the ribs. I open my eyes, and there's a, the guy controlling the cage. His uh, mate of mine called Chris Balsam. He's looking at the, uh, he's looking at me like that as I'm just being punched in the ribs about a million times. And I went, all right, mate. And he goes, you all right? I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Chris starts laughing. Anyway, so I'm like, I'm like giving it the big and like, oh, I'm mega relaxed. Like, right, okay, I'm going to come out for this third round. All of a sudden the bell goes, goes ding. And I just went, boom. <laughs> like I'm on the deck, like can't move. My eyes shut up. I'm jogging to get up. I was in the wrong corner. My mates come over and Dingle and uh, Willis who were cornering me. Um, Shout out to those guys. And uh, they were like, Bassy, get up. I went, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> the referee goes, you're in the wrong corner. And you can fuck off. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> end, end of point. Yeah. So um, all I had to do was survive the last round and I'd have won because of the 10-8, you know? Mm. So, um, but yeah, that was that. Was that. I also did like, um, I don't know if it was before that or after, I did an unlicensed boxing that I took on. I took on 12 hours notice after two weeks on the, two weeks solidly on the piss. And, uh, it was just when I met my missus and she was like, you're going to do what? And I was like, oh, I've been off in a fight. I think I'm going to go help my mate out because everyone's pulling out this card. And he was, she was like, no, don't do that. I was like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, and uh, went along with my brother-in-law. who gets angry if I don't give him a shout. Um, froggy. Um, so we went along. This guy kept coming in my change room trying to intimidate me. And I'm like, I'm, I, I get the other way. Like I need to like chill myself out because if I was going to, if I was going to try and like be like a uh, professional, or adopt like a professional mindset or attitude or, you know, strategy. Try and look at it as, you know, sparring or whatever. But for me, it's like, it's a chance to have a fight. That's that's the only reason I'm doing it because I, I want an outlet for for my aggression and frustration and stuff. So I just want to have a scrap. So um, I'm just chilling out, listening to Rocket Man on repeat. Like, and I'm like, what's he doing? And mates of mine from um, uh, from Nuki who I met out in Thailand, JP and uh, Mark Roulette and those guys, um, Dean, they're like getting really angry at this guy and I'm like, don't worry about it. So then um, one of the lads comes in who's, who's from the from the event and goes, Bassy goes, um, who's your corner? I went, oh, um, I haven't got one. He goes, fucking hell. He goes, I, like, I'll corner you. He goes, because um, there's some other stuff going on as well. He goes, I'll corner you. He goes, where's your drink? I went, ah, oh, I don't have one. And um, the guy I was fighting, the guy I was fighting, someone told me that um, they were basically telling him that what I told them in confidence, like he hasn't fought for, he hasn't fought for ages. He hasn't trained for ages. He's got no cardio. He hasn't sparred for four months. He hasn't even trained for three months. And he was on the piss for two weeks. So he's going to wear himself out in the first round, go mental, try and knock you out. Just survive the first round. So all this got told to me. So I was like, right, okay. So he goes, well, what are you going to do? I was like, 
let's just get mental. <laughs> try, try and get it done in like a minute. And he's like, all right. So we went in. Luckily, like within a minute, mate, mate he was like in a, in a bad way, um, knocked out. And um, yeah, so I got away with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was quite a funny one. Um, yeah, nice guy as well he was. <laughs> still is still is I'm sure <laughs> fucking hell fair play mate Cornish, so, Cornish boxing's big yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, mate those, those, white, those white fucking collar shows though mate some of the shit oh, you mate. see on those yeah. fucking hell they, they do the um, they do like the the charity MMA shows now as well don't they my mate from the boxing one recently <sighs> and he's had no real experience he's a, he's a lovely lad yeah. got in there and this lad he was fighting he, he, my, my mate battered him yeah. with no experience but every time he was like getting the better of him a little bit mate he was turning around like just oh, literally no. like turning around. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? And then the ref would stop the fight and he'd readjust his fucking head guard, put his mouthpiece back in, give him a slap on the head. And then my mate would go in, bum, 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 chin him. And then he'd do the same again <laughs> to get him through the three rounds. Just hadn't like, sparred enough. Like. Just, just yeah. mate, the, the, I think he'd done, I think they do a seven or eight week camp to go into a boxing yeah. boxing match. But they've, they've had no, like, like my mate had no previous experience. I don't think. Yeah, mate, it's, it's bonkers, and and you'll probably know this as well, mate. Well, I, I don't know whether like down, down like or they like down your end, but sparring, even hard sparring, is not the same as fighting, is it? No, it's like a different level of intensity. And you, even with jujitsu, you found yeah. this out recently, right. right? And the amount of people I've seen in those shows where they'll go in and you see him get it properly for the first time, yeah, and like a fucking deer in headlights after that. And that's probably this guy is just then turning his back and he's turning his back, mate. I couldn't believe it. And yeah, the whole show was a fucking joke, really. You know what I mean? You're watching, you're watching like two really fat guys yeah. slogging at each other for fucking <laughs> 20, honestly, 20 honestly. Seconds and then no, that was it. Yeah, they were yeah. fucking tr- going out there. He's thirty seconds, and they were fucked like like no, Marlon Manoff like and Cyborg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> round three. Yeah, yeah, mate. It's fucking yeah. It's funny old business. So are you are you out of the garage doing proper training now, there, mate? Yeah, well, we still we still train in the garage. I've been getting grief this week for um for not training enough from uh, Sean and uh, Sean and Watson being giving me a lot of grief. Um, yeah, just so busy, mate. Because um, what, what gym are you based at? So I train at um, Resolute BJJ, um, and I also train at Lift MMA. Um, and then there's there's Cornwall's like uh, it's, it's funny like there's loads popping up down there now. There, there are there are loads down there. Some really good there's some really good gyms down there. You've got um, Kone BJJ down in uh, Campbell and Madrid, which is like big big setup. Yeah, um, lovely isn't it. That's where we um, met Miko. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, yeah. there you go. Um, I, I couldn't remember what the link was there. Um, then you've got some some cool gyms in Newquay. Some good guys over there. You've got people like Mark Roulette over in yeah, Newquay. Yeah, they've been down there for fucking years. Yeah, it? and then you've got um, you've got like uh, Mark Tucker and um, yeah, Steve Brown and stuff boys, up yeah. in like uh, Wadebridge sort of Liscard area. Um, then down in Penzance, you know Penzance Hill, Touch Gloves and all those guys. Kev Darrington at Pure Grappling. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the, the guys they're turning out, it, it's amazing. Like, you know, the, the week before my fight, I rolled, rolled with uh, a guy down there, it's only a little lad as well, like, sorry, Dan. Um, Dan Lucas. <laughs> and uh, bear in mind, it's like, I don't know, four days before my fight or whatever. I roll with this guy. <clears throat> catches me in, like, there's just stuff I'm not used to as well. Um, it catches me in, like, this manic triangle twice and then something else. And I was like, for oh, fuck's sake, afterwards, I was like, I was like, mate, um, because the last guy I trained with from down there was a brown belt and uh, like really good guy, Ollie. And I was like, Jesus Christ, you're good. Anyway, so I said to Dan, I was like, how long have you been training, mate? He goes, oh, about a year and a half. And I was like, for fuck's sake. Like, I was like, you're white belt? He's like, yeah. I was like, fuck's sake. Go um, watch the white belts, mate. Huh? But yeah. So, oh, watch but, out for us, mate. Watch out, mate. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially like with your sort of MMA garage jitsu guys, you know, like you don't get belts in garages, do you? No. But um, yeah, cool was a bit like that. You know, everybody kind of... It's, it's so small that it's not really territorial. Everybody's cool and everybody knows each other. And, you know, if, if you move maybe a mile this way, you might like, look, you know, I'm going to go here a bit more and we all sort of pop in and out. But that's that's cool as well because I think it says a lot for your um, coaches and instructors and gym owners and stuff that, that aren't like, you know, your, your stereotypical, um, I, won't, I won't say the chain, but, you know, you have to wear our gi and you have to buy our gi and you can't train anywhere else and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, yeah, go, go there and yeah. go there and learn. And if that's a better time for you, go there, yeah. you know? Yeah. Maybe they're just trying to get rid of me. Yeah, maybe, man. <laughs> <laughs> go, <laughs> go. The, the good lads down there. There's a few of the lads you mentioned that I know. I, I, would have, I would have left people out as well, so sorry. Yeah, I mean, Kev, um, Darren Tony's um, one of Kenny's back belts and I've known Kev fucking out 15 years. Been training yeah. On and off with him 15 years. Nice so. guy. Yeah, yeah, good jujitsu down there very as well. Good, very good teacher. Yeah, so let's talk. Uh, let's talk skin infections, mate. 
keeping us clean, speaking of grappling. Yeah. So grappler's soap, mate, how did that how did that come about? So it came about in the uh, aforementioned garage um, that belonged to Sean. He had, uh, his, you know, it's a 20 foot by 10 foot garage, just padded um, up to about two meters high in 40 mil pads, 40 mil mats and um, wow. floor, walls, everything's padded. And um, it, it's like, a, you know, it's like a phone box. You just go in. It's different because when you go and then train like an open mat or something or a big gym with like a, you know, a big matted room, mm -hmm. It's so different because we would literally be bouncing each other off the walls and stuff, trying to get takedowns, and it's just and it and it kind of would just like you imagine like a bouncy ball in a little room. It just goes mental, doesn't it? Yeah. So like you you go in there and one one person just elevates it a little bit and it, it just goes mental. So it's always Watson that does that as well, by the way. Um, so yeah, we were in there one day after training. and I've been thinking about it for about for a few months. Anyway, I, I said to the guy, I said, oh, I'm going to um, start making my own soup. And they were like, they just started laughing their heads. I was like, what? you're not making soap. And I was like, no, I am, honestly. Like, um, I've got real sensitive skin. And I'm um, like, washing powder if I changed it, shower gels. I, did, I didn't make these issues with shower gels until after I made the soap. Um, but anything like certain fabrics would just be murder. Um, so, I, so I tried uh, defense soap. I had an idea of how it's going to look, smell, feel. Um, and uh, I was underwhelmed. So I tried some other ones. Uh, that I won't mention. Tried some some independent ones in the UK, um, some some stuff off eBay, Etsy. Just everything was not as, not what I thought it should be. I thought I thought it could be better. So I spent about three months researching um, ingredients, ways of making soap, blah blah blah. Um, and then I tried some, and the first batch I made was better than defense soap. And I said to the guys, so I said, not only not only am I going to make soap, but it's going to be better than defense soap. And they were like, you're off your head. So anyway, I took some in. Like, I was like, "Try that," and they're like, "Those that come out, they went, mate, that's that's mega." Um, and then a few people said, "The only thing is, it doesn't lather up too much." Like, okay, cool. So I changed the ingredients. Uh, didn't take anything away, but I added a couple of bits in that um, would help with the alkalinity as well as um, lathering and exfoliating, um, and just making it um, you know feel nicer um, and you know work better as something that you know you're going to enjoy showering with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was that was it. Within you know three months of research and then probably another six or eight weeks of just tweaking bits. It, it was everything it is now. And um, started out just, I, you know, I was just making enough soap for me. So I, I made 12 bars and I had to give a load away. And they were like, oh, can I can have some more of that soap. I'm like, Fuck so I made, then I made like, I don't know, a hundred bars or whatever it was. And that went, and I was like, Christ. And then um, lads like, you're going to sell it. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I had like a spare, a spare Instagram because I, I do, I forgot to mention, I do a bit of art. I do a bit of painting and um, visual art. So um, I had a spare Instagram that was like not our Instagram, it was just BJJ and MMA and sort of training. So I was like, oh, I call it Grappler's Soap, made a logo up, stuck it on, um, went on eBay and it just started selling. And I was like, oh, this is all right. And so like, I don't know, 70 quid or whatever. And I was like, if I could one day like pay for my car, you know, every month or something like that, or half a mortgage, or, that'd be amazing. And it just went, it just went crazy, um, just like straight off. Um, you know, just doubled and doubled and doubled. And doubled. I, I'd have to do like, oh, I'm sold out, sorry. I'd make twice as much next month. Sorry again, I'm sold out. Like, you know, next month I'm like, right, can't that, no way that's going to happen, but I'll make twice as much again. Mm -hmm. It's sell out. <clears throat> and then like the more people that used it, uh, it was all BJJ guys, all MMA guys. Um, and then I'd get people sending me a message like, oh, mate, um, I have to buy some more soap because it's so good. It smells so nice that my missus keeps nicking it. Um, and then like I'd hear this all the time. Um, and then it started to be like, oh, by the way, my wife has been using your soap now for a month and it's, it's like cured her eczema. Now, that's not me saying it's cured for eczema, but this is what, what the feedback I'm getting. It's cured her eczema. Or, my wife used it for psoriasis, psoriasis. Did you know it's good for psoriasis? I was like, I didn't even know what psoriasis was at the time, you know? So I'm like, it's amazing how many people have psoriasis because eczema is something you hear about, you know? Like I had a little bit of eczema as a kid and, you know, still do or did. Um, my little brother always had it as a kid. Um, and you see people sort of, Oh, that's like eczema. Mm -hmm. um, psoriasis, you don't really see an awful lot, but mm -hmm. people get loads of psoriasis. And I had loads and loads of messages once sort of I started saying, oh, this is good for psoriasis, you know, or people have been telling me this is good for psoriasis. People message me, oh, mate, I've had that for years and it really affects my confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, can, can you send me some of your soap? Like, oh, can I buy some soap? Yeah, here, I'd send them. That's amazing. My, my psoriasis is clearing up. And, um, you know, uh, I've told this story a hundred times probably, but... Um, Someone got hold of me, oh, you know, is it any good for, for kids with um, <clears throat> eczema? I said, yeah, well, it should be. I can't say that it will cure eczema and I can't say it's good for kids or whatever, but people have been using it for that. 
okay, I'll buy some. I was like, no, I'll send you some. So I sent this guy some soap and he was like, no, no, I'll buy it. I was like, no, I'll send it to you because then you're going to let me know how it goes. And so he, like he turned around, he said, um, there were two quotes from his six year old son and it was one was daddy. Now my skin isn't sore all the time. And I was like, mate, like amazing. And then the second quote was now I can wear shorts without people staring at my legs. And that was like, I don't know, April, May. So coming into summer, you've got a six year old that's yeah. now going to wear oh, shorts. Amazing, so, mate. Yeah. So, so it's awesome. And that's kind of, then I had a little bit of a, a sort of a decision to make because like, it's almost like there could have been like a bifurcation of, of um, the brand. And do I then diversify and, um, sort of aim it more at people with um, skin complaints or do I keep it as grappler soap? Do I do I water it down so it's kind of a sort of multi-appealing blob? And I was like, I thought like, don't, just keep it what it is. Mm -hmm. Keep keep the brand what it is. Keep it all get aimed at MMA, BJJ. Every, everything's working with it and don't try and sort of, don't try and make it vanilla so it appeals to everybody because, you know, like who, who likes vanilla? Who's going to choose vanilla ice cream over like, you know, like a proper nice flavor, you know, you're not going to are you? So mm. it's better to find your tribe and appeal to them strongly than kind of be a three out of 10 for everybody in the world. Yeah. So yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's how we, how we gone. Yeah. That'd be nice. What do you think of it? You've been using it for a Yeah, while. I've been using it, mate. Gone through one bar. Good. Hi, oh. touch wood. I've got a I haven't had anything, mate. No. In his, in his little's bag. Six or seven weeks. So. In my little's bag, yeah. Um, so, I looked what I had on the shelf, and I, one's a medium, one's a large, a size. These are cult t shirts. Oh, legend. Um, a medium, mate, you? That'll be medium, yeah, it's large for you. I don't know if that's a medium, I don't know. Um, got some stickers, so. That's my good set of stickers. These are my. I, I can smell you've got soap in that bag, yeah. mate. I can smell oh, on here. That's lovely, doesn't yeah. it? These are stickers, Watson designer, amazing. Grapper suit. <laughs> cool. Car stickers. Amazing. Um, and obviously the world's finest sake for people Beauty. that like to check other people until they make snorty noises <laughs> mate appreciate it thank you you okay. just ran out as well yeah. so there you go mate there you go mate no I, I've, I've been using it as well it's um, yeah it's it's much better than the fence up. mate it's it, I love the smell of it yeah it was crazy at first when I was telling people that and um, you know like, like look I wanted it to be better than defense soap and it is and um and people were sort of like, yeah, whatever. And then they try it and they go, fuck, no, it is better, you know? So, um, and that's quite cool because, you know, everybody knows what defense soap is. And I'm not saying anything bad about defense soap either, you know, like, cool that, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be the owner of defense soap? Like, that's cool. And it's probably sorted out a load of people's skin and stopped a load of people getting staff. So nothing bad against them. And we've got like a sort of um, a comedy fatwa against um, <laughs> Dr. Squatch. <laughs> Which all started because of um, around the same time as that Combat Sports UK article about the world's most violent soap. Um, jiu Jitsu Legacy magazine, uh, who I followed for years, did a post on Facebook and it was about um, Jiu Jitsu equipment, protective equipment for Jiu Jitsu. And there was a little tiny little sub chapter about soaps and it was like um, Dr. Squatch and Defense Soap and I don't know, Armbar Soap Company or whatever, because it's predominantly American readership. And I put, I at the time, I'd done like a 12 hour night shift, a six hour drive home. I was sat in a bath with a cup of tea and I, just, I was just looking through my messages and mate Michael uh, had uh, tagged me in this thing on, on Facebook. So I'm massively sleep deprived. Like, you know, like, <laughs> and I read this thing with this little thing and I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, a little bit about soap. So I'm like, so I put the thing at the bottom, like, um, I know most of you guys are in the USA. Um, we're in the UK. Uh, if you're in the UK, give us a shout. We can help you out. Um, if you're in the US, there's plenty of good soaps out there. Just find, find one, you know, try loads, find one awesome better than nothing i thought it was mega nice especially sleep deprived anyway so someone someone uh in the bright days club at dr squatch replied back with this really snarky comment and it just and i just replied back and it was something like really like uh who are you or something like this i can't remember what the comment was but i replied back with um i'll choke you to fucking death <laughs> 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 and uh, didn't really think anything more of it anyway so uh, that blew up then because everybody that saw it thought it, thought it was funny they yeah. kind of knew where it was coming from luckily because it could have like could have got really bad um, but they, they appreciated the humour in it and then anytime anybody then would see a Dr. Scotch post they would tag me in it and they was like Mr. Bass is going to check you to death why won't you, why won't you fight him and then um, yeah Jiu Jitsu Legacy Magazine then got hold of me and said oh, what's this all about you know can we do a can we do an interview and an article on your soap and stuff? It's an interesting brand. So, yeah, it's, it's funny how um, 
uh, things come about just from little comments or you know, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> throwaway <laughs> comments and you're just like a bit like, oh, fuck off, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, I chased you to death to a, a, you know, this mythical 10 foot in Sasquatch or whatever <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's actually a doctor either like. oh I have no idea mate but yeah, I, I ain't got a clue I don't even know who he is I've never even seen a Sasquatch at medical school so. yeah. <laughs> um, I think I spread somewhere that your soap is pharmacist approved yeah so it's uh, it's kind of like an industry standard to be honest yeah. um, so to to be approved funnily enough in America there's a lot less red tape with um, soap making and um, sort of um, cosmetics and stuff. But in the UK, uh, you have to get a CPSR, Consumer Product Safety Review. So basically then a dermatologist or um, pharmacist um, has to look at it. Okay, all the ratios of everything and, you know, they, they give it an eyeball in and check everything's good. So, yeah, so it's um, according to them, it's good stuff. So, And the, the one negative I've got, and you'll, you'll probably tell me why this is the case... Love the soap, but it's a pain in the ass in my kit bag. Mm. Are you any plans to make shower gel? No. Why not? Because um, I did. I, I heard heard this a lot initially, and I still get it occasionally. Um, you should do a body wash, you do a shower gel, just because it's easier. And I was like, yes, that's a good point. Um, and I'm like, more sort of dollar signs going around me, head, like Scrooge McDuck. I'm like, yes, more money. <laughs> um, uh, the reason that I haven't done it is because I tried doing it a couple of times, and it was good. Um, you know, it was decent. It was better than anything else I've, I found in a bottle, but it wasn't that. Um, and why, like, why would I, unless I'm going to do a completely different brand and, you know, there's, there's merit in that as well, but, you know, whatever's body wash for jujitsu, um, I wouldn't want to associate it with grappler soap because that is so good. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? No, no one ever has a bar of that and goes, oh, it's not bad. Mm. They go, fucking hell, that's good. Mm. Um, and... I couldn't do that with the with the body wash. None of the other body washes I've I've tried over are, are I think that. Um, so I just went, no, I'm not doing it. Mm. So keep it, keep it for for what it is, and you know, and I think it's better just to be something that's very appealing and excellent, and you know, definite in its branding and you know its mission, um, than than be you know, like I said, vanilla vanilla 7 out of 10 body wash or whatever so yeah, fair just tell me to shut the fuck up and buy a soap bag yeah just buy a fucking soap bag yeah <laughs> <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard you only go training once or twice a year oh, anyway so <laughs> <laughs> he does watch a podcast yeah, <laughs> yeah no I've got called out I've been a little, little bit more frequent since mate it's like two times a year now my mates will be watching this going you cheeky bastard pot and kettle <laughs> so mate like Soap violence. This is sounding more and more like fucking Tyler Daly from Fight Club, mate. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what people say it all the time and they go, "Oh, you should do." And I like look at the Instagram. That there's a Watson did a, a poster with they've just changed it for the grappler soap. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty yeah cool. nice, mate. This is where you realise that we're actually imaginary. You, nothing's real. Yeah, well, I'm imaginary, so yeah. it's fine. Yeah. And just just to clarify, you're not you're not robbing like libel suction clinics to, no. to make the soap. What's funny about that is um, people go like, "Oh, that's crazy," and I go, "Well, you know, like." Um, it's essentially the same way of making soap as if you use tallow, which is a really good ingredient for soap, like beef fat. Um, and the whole premise of Fight Club was it was liposuction, liposuction fat, wasn't it, from yeah. from humans? So potentially you could make some quite good soap doing that. Yeah. Um, you'd have to probably get like boring sort of, I don't know, like vegan or full carnivore or something. Because <laughs> otherwise, like, you don't want all that shit here. <laughs> And I uh, take it you're not also making dynamite as a result from the Reds, as you know. Mate, that's an idea. Actually. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's he called? I can't remember. What was the operation called when uh, Old Meatloaf gets killed? His yeah. name was... I always forget his name. Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. Yeah. His name was Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, class film. Fucking love it. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So good. Uh, mate, tell us about your other brand, Colt. What's that about? So, um, Colt Brand UK, I started... Um, as most things I do, uh, we were back of insomnia, um, coming back from work and my body clock was uh, not really adjusted to my schedule. And I was kind of up at about 4 a.m. and I was, that's when I sort of do my admin and do stuff. And I've been resisting the urge to um, to start a another brand for a while because it's you, you can't just sort of do it willy-nilly and hope it succeeds. You know, you really got to push these things uphill for, you guys all know that, you know, you've got to, you've got to get going to get momentum, you know, and you might have to, push uphill for a couple of years to get things going um i've been very lucky with grapplers say the way it's gone but um i i think that um a masculinity has been really sort of downtrodden um demonized in um 
uh, modern society. I think maybe the pendulum's swinging back a little bit now because people are starting to see that, and it's you know, and it just got ridiculous a couple of years ago, didn't it? Sort of a year ago. Um, but I thought that um, uh, masculinity is underrepresented um, as the you know the the not only worthwhile thing that it is, but an essential part of um, society. You know, like feminism. You know, femininity um, can't succeed in society unless masculinity is there as well. The balance, and that's not just men and women. It's you know the male and female um, aspects or characteristics that we have. You know, um, you know, you you can say what you like about sort of. Um, gender stereotypes or genotypes or whatever you want to call it but um as men you know we're we're, we're less agreeable um we're we're more prone to aggression um we're bigger stronger you know we like to provide we like to protect um and that, those aren't things that you know they're all things that you could sort of look at as um pejorative or derogatory but you know the fact that we're less agreeable more aggressive bigger and stronger and we like to provide and protect for people that's, that's because that's that's what we do that's what we have done for since we came down from the plains you know um come down from trees onto the plains we look after the tribe and then the tribe prospers because then the people that are, that are more nurturing you know uh, more caring uh you know better better at sort of multitasking is what one thing you was hearing you know it's a reason for that um they can then prosper and do, do the jobs that they do so i was getting a bit fed up of it all and, and also i I'd resisted for a while because I was like, ah, oh, you know, not my circus, not my monkeys is, is sort of, I think, a Polish proverb that I quite like and, you know, like, ah, oh, whatever. Um, but it is annoying. And then you kind of look at it and you go, right, well, you know, there's a lot of a lot of blokes that feel trapped. Uh, a lot of blokes top themselves. Uh, the quote is like, um, you know, one of the great quotes that I like is, most men leave, lead, lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm. So true, you know, like, think about your sort of stereotypical... 40, 50 year old bloke, you know, hates going to work on a Monday, sort of goes to work, comes home, goes to the pub or whatever just to get a release. And, you know, like blokes feel trapped. And, and also, like, because we are providers, protectors, you know, the, the strong one in a relationship a lot of the time, not always. Um, and these are all generalizations, but they are, you know, um, scientific generalizations, not just me sort of going, oh, blokes are wicked. Um, because you're the strong one in a relationship. I, I think this is part of the reason why a lot of blokes top themselves. Because um, you're the strong one in a relationship. If you're a bloke and you're worried about things, you're worried about money or you're worried about, you know, your health or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, a lot of blokes won't go home and talk to their missus because they don't want to worry the missus. And then all of a sudden they, they make themselves into a little emotional island and they can't talk to their mates about it because they don't want to look like a dickhead. Do you know what I mean? And, and then I think, I think that's why it's people that are, that are just topping themselves or mm. getting depressed. And it, I think it's, although... Although the suicide rate is probably getting worse and wasn't helped by the uh, the health pandemic where we shut all the gyms and made people stay in the houses on their own for 18 months while we let inflation skyrocket and all that sort of stuff. Not that I'll get into that. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought um, pe people, I think if you've got an opinion on something and you think that you think that you're right and then you you sort of try and try and prove yourself wrong, but you you still got that opinion and you think that something should be said and, you know, and you can you can say it, and you can make yourself a platform and say it. Like, why not say? So that's why I started Cult. Mm -hmm. I'd um, I'd been coming up with sort of designs for clothing and stuff that didn't really fit with Grapple and Soap because it was more like a you know, sort of fashiony label than um, than like sort of utilitarian merch for a for a BJJ or MMA grappling soap sort of thing. So I was like, oh, I've had all these ideas already parked up in my head, but I didn't want to start a clothing brand or a skincare brand but then i was like right well if i then want to make like a uh shaving and beard oil or a moisturizer or whatever else you know that that's then it doesn't have to be grapplers beard oil do you know what i mean it can be whatever else so that's why i started cult brand um as a sort of because then i can i can promote um uh mental health i can promote uh activities that i think are good i can promote um, values that i think are good you know um stuff that's you're just not hearing I, you know, I did a post the other week and it was, it came out, I, I, you could probably interpret it one way and just go, oh, that, that guy's. And I was saying like, it was a photo of me stood on a rock, A, because I was in Wicked Nick at the time. And um, B, because it, I was like, if I, st if I stand on a rock and decide that I'm a seagull, does everybody have to call me a seagull? I would, mate. You, yeah, well, well, this is what I was saying. I was, I was saying, I would... I call if you a prick, mate. If you, yeah, exactly. I was like, if you stand on a rock and say you're a seagull, look, I'll, I'll call you Mr. Seagull if you want, or Mrs. Seagull, or however you identify as a seagull. That's no problem. But I'm not going to tell my kids that you are a seagull. Mm. 
just because you think you're a seagull or you want to be a seagull, you identify as a seagull, whatever it is. Um, and, it, you know, obviously that's, you could read into that how you are, but, you know, so, and, that, and that's how I think as well. Like, no matter what we're being told and stuff, it's like, okay, cool, you're, you identify as whatever, but you're not going in a change room with my little girls. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what I mean? If you, 100%. I saw a post this week, it was, there's, a, there's a professor of journalism, a professor of journalism, and they were saying that young children should be exposed to adult male genitalia to prepare them. Is it, it's an interesting idea to prepare them for when they are changing in a women's changing room with trans males. Sorry, trans females. So as in mm. women with cocks, right? So my little kids are at a swimming pool or whatever and there's a woman with a cock in there, right? Like, no. Like, I just think it's getting so silly, what? isn't it? It's like let's let's call a spade. It's getting just it's 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 unbelievable. It's just silly, isn't it? And I think at some point people are just going to go. You know what? Enough's enough now. Do you know what I mean? It can't it can't go any further than well, this because hundred percent. Like then you you probably get you probably had it already. You probably get a little bit of backlash from yeah. talking like this, right? Yeah, yeah. But in in a private setting for most. Men, women as well. I want to say it's not every. You speak to you speak to ninety fucking seven percent of people, normal people, <clears throat> everyday working people from the UK that we've ever spoke to. They would have a very similar opinion to that because we don't want those sorts of things happening. I've got instances where I had I was working in a shop. I had a shop for years, and uh, there's a guy that used to come in all the time, and he. Uh, he, Gavin, and he was, you know, a bit odd, and he was an ex-sex offender, and, you know, he used to come in by games, very odd guy, and then one day he come in, he's, he's literally just got a pink t-shirt on, with jeans, bald head still, you know, whatever, and he comes in, he goes, I'm not Gavin anymore, I'm Gabby. So I look at him, fucking all right, like... Still, a, any, still an ex-sex offender, mind. Exactly, yeah. But what can I do? I can't, you know, fucking hell whatever it with uh i can't kick him out the shop every single time because he's actually done nothing in my shop so legally we've we've checked on this the the, the market that we work for they couldn't ban him because he's done nothing you know he's whatever anyway has an argument with the market because he wants to go then that day normal bloke with a bored head egg in a nest looks like fucking mr barnes because he's got a fucking pink t-shirt on wants to go in the women's change room uh the women's toilets that day and then he comes back and catches and he's kicking off in the street because he's not allowed in the women's change rooms. And then the, the council or whoever it was, they was um, having to write a, an apology. It's, it's just mad, How it? is that even like, do you know what I mean? Like a, no, like a normal thing. Like it's, it's, it's being played on by people like that. And there's people that genuinely go through these transitions and I've, you know, I worked in a public sector for years and there were some genuine people that did go through that and they're lovely people. But then you've got these fucking predators, mate. Yep. These fucking predators that it's, it's a bit more attention. It's a bit more, they can play on their sexual deviance a little bit more. And that's the ones that are fucking going too far with it at times. They are going too far with it. And that's the fucking issue. It's, it's like, armor as well. Mate, that, that's it. Because you can't touch him. You can't sit here and say that. You know what I mean? There's been times when I've had my son, especially when he was younger in the shop, and you've had, you know, some people like that where I know their past because we're aware of it, because we have to be aware of it because of the shop and because of the kids and safety. You know, we're a game shop, so it attracts those fucking type of people, you know what I mean? And um, we'd have lists and, and all sorts of stuff. And it, they would come in and they would just play on this fucking thing. And they would just be, they would, they'd be spouting off about how people are, are transphobic and how people and and the truth of it was a lot of them weren't transphobic uh, uh they weren't they weren't transsexual they weren't changing genders they were just wearing a pink t-shirt and then using it as an excuse to try to touch to move to fucking get in these areas where they couldn't do before you know what i mean and that's yeah. what it is and it, and it sucks as well doesn't it like because like you say there are genuinely people genuinely people that are um suicide rate with um trans people yeah, very high, I believe, right? Um, so there's people that are in a lot of uh, emotional torment and stuff, and you know they feel like they're in the wrong body or whatever. Like you know, I don't, I don't profess to understand it. You know, like it's not, it's not where I'm coming from. Um, but you know, what a situation to be in. Um, and these people are having a hard time already. And then you've got the people that are just taking it way too far. And it's like, and all I was saying, the whole thing was like, it, it doesn't matter what you say you are. Um, I'll treat you as as whatever. Okay, cool. Or like, you know, treat, treat people with respect, you know, and, and love and kindness wherever you can. Um, 
But when it then encroaches on my kid's safety or my kid's view, like even just their view of the world, like, oh, that's that over there is a dog. It's not a dog. It's someone that, that's pretending to be a dog. You know, yeah. do you know what I mean? Oh, you're a furry. Are you cool? Like, no, I'm not going to. And this is why, and it, you know, I mentioned about when we were chatting um, the other day about, like, you know, the fourth turning and stuff, you know, like um, good times. So good men create good times. Good times, uh, good men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times create good men. And it's, we, we know, people gone about millennials or, or Gen Z and how useless they are. It's because the generation before them um, were afforded so much freedom by their parents that, you know, like, if you think about growing up, like, you know, and I love my parents and they're cool as fuck. But, you know, there's loads of, like, videos and VHSs and, and um, photos of, of us, you know, with all the, all the family and stuff. And everyone's got a fag hanging out of their mouth or whatever, you know. And it's, like, three o'clock in the afternoon, whatever. Everyone's smoking around the kids. And, do you know what I mean? Like, everybody was just off playing. And we'd go to the beach for, like, four hours or whatever and go and see you, whatever. And it wasn't this helicopter parent, parenting, but... The, the style of parenting that's happening now, whereas like, with this generation of little shits everybody moans about all the time, is because everybody's been like, oh, fuck, you know, I had so much freedom as a kid and my parents were smoking around me. I'm going to be a really good parent. So they overparent, they helicopter parent. And, that, and, it, and it's the, the generation before you, the times that they are in dictate the, the parenting and the parenting dictates the generation and then the generation dictates the time. And it, it's just this little... Um, little cycle that keeps going on it goes through time like you know the fourth turning that, um, that I mentioned you know the end of every um, sort of these are like roughly generational 20 to 30 year sort of um, cycles you know and then the end of every uh, fourth one you have the fourth turning you know and so you, and you can look it looks like a really sort of daunting thing and it's a really negative thing as well, and a lot of upheaval a lot of problems the end of a civilization you know um we've come we've come off the petrodollar you know so all the BRICS nations now come off the petrodollar so you know the the dollar as a global reserve currency has gone down that loses its power and then you know you've got china and russia brazil india um uh, south africa you know sort of coming up and you look at that and go what what does that mean for us well it could mean like you know like a, a third world war you know like we've We've been skirting around it with, with um, sort of Ukraine for a while. So and you go, oh, Christ, that's terrible. And it is terrible. But maybe that's maybe that's what brings around the fourth turn. And then you get through that. And then maybe we'll be the generation of, of old boys that, you know, that sort of can remember the war or whatever and then live their, their spring, summer and autumn, you know. And we die of old age in the end of the summer. So you have another 40, 50 years of a great life after 10 years of upheaval. So it's not, it's not a hundred percent. I think you're right in what you're saying though, negative. because me and Paul both probably had like a bit grub and shit places. And I definitely, definitely don't want my boy having that fucking experience. So mm. I do do that. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I we, want we him talk, to go to a better time, school. I made sure he'd done his 11 class. Did. I've given tutoring. Like, I want him to not experience the fucking shit that I experienced, you know, and it was yeah. never that bad. But if you were, I never thought it was that bad until we, we spoke about it more. And then we, you go back, you think, fucking hell, it's a bit weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean? Those things that happened and going out, like you said, you quite fucking hours, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah you know yeah. what I mean? You'd, you'd come home from school and I'd be gone. I'd be gone. Mum said, be in by nine. Oh, yeah. And I wouldn't be home until fucking, I'd be on probably our past night every hey. night. She'd be like, where the fuck you been? You know what I mean? As, as kids, if you hear there's like a pedo, or something, oh, right? To... That would be like brilliant. Like, you know, it would be like let's, yeah, let's go and spy on the pedo. Yeah, no, we say that. And do you know what? Most of the time, you want a fucking pedo. He's just a geezer that's moved into a house on his own. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's a fucking pedo. Yeah, but, yeah. No, mad mate. I mean, you know, but you know, you're exactly right in what you're saying with that because as soon as you said that, I thought you're fucking right. Yeah. I 100. percent I don't. I don't hel helicopter parent him. You know what I mean? I'm not. But. Their generation's fucking different, mate. They don't go out, doesn't go out on the street mm. all night, nothing like that. You know, he goes down the park now and again, plays football for maybe 20 minutes, half hour. Mate. He'll pop back and I'll be like, you're right. He'll go, yeah, I'm just going up now that's, on my Xbox, mate. Do. Go up on my Xbox yeah. and I'll, my, all my mates are coming on now to play FIFA. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. So I so I got two little girls and I live down in Truro in Cornwall, which is one of the safer parts of the UK, which is one of the safer parts of the world, right? So I never thought I'd ever be having a conversation with, you know, I've got a 10 year old and a nine year old and they're awesome. Um, but there was a, within like, within, I don't know, the space of three months or whatever, there was a, there was a 15 year old girl raped by three lads behind the cathedral in Truro. Um, 14, 15 and 16 year old lad, 
like local, um, raped this 15 year old girl. And then there was a 13 year old girl raped in uh, Bodmin. Someone would drive alongside a road spotted her, no. raped her. Um, so I was having to then think about A, how do I explain what rape is? And B, how do I, because how do I try and make my kids, my daughter, my eldest daughter was like, oh, can I go to watch um, my mate play? My mate's dad's playing some sport somewhere and it's somewhere mega safe, but like mega rural. But same, same as Bodmin, same as Truro. So I was like, no, because who's going to be looking after you? She's like, oh, my friend's dad's. Pl-. But I said, like, no, he's playing football or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's not looking after you. Yeah, but we'll be right. I was like, no. And then I was like, now I need to like qualify why it was a no. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, right, listen. So now I'm like trying to trying to explain. And I got my youngest into jiu-jitsu initially. She stopped again, but she, she's going back apparently of her own volition. Uh, my eldest was like, was like, no, not into it. But she's got knockout power in her hands. <laughs> it's cool. So I'm like, okay, cool. You just need to keep your hands on. But um, so I was, I was trying to explain. So I'm then showing them like, right, okay. So if someone pins you down, right, you get your thumbs in their eyes. You know, if you can, you headbutt them. If you can bite their nose, you bite their nose. Just anything to get away. But if you get your thumbs in their eyes, and I'm making them do it on me, I'm like, ah, that's all right. No, no, like imagine you're pushing that in and trying to get that right in and get their eyeballs out. And they're like, oh, it's horrible, daddy. I'm like, but if somebody is trying to do this thing to you, like if, if it's a boy who's much older than you, who's pinning you down like that and you're scared, you take their eyeballs out. I was like, take their eyeballs out, bite their nose off, do what you can. So then, then you run because they're going to be bigger than you. They're going to be stronger than you. So you can't do anything about that. All you can do is like, take them out of that fight you know make them in a mood not to rape you anymore because you're like i don't know like i generally don't feel like raping people if my eyeballs have been pulled out you know mm-hmm. it's not like oh, i'm gonna crack on with this you know because because i like to achieve what i started out at. so yeah and what a horrible thing to have to explain to you yeah. you know a, t- a 10 year old mm-hmm. and that's not me being like overly overly cautious because i'm in a security role and you know may- maybe i'm sort of biased to to sort of see the negatives and see the dangers in mm-hmm. things but I thought it was a sort of a necessary conversation, unfortunately, you have to have. And I, was yeah, like, so I think it is with everyone, though. Like, it's really similar. My lad's going to secondary school this year. We were just talking about a few bits and pieces, and uh, there was someone in the street, like, getting gobby, and they, <laughs> it's stupid, but two lads across the road from me nicked some dust caps. So Kirsty's doing the dishes, and she goes, Dan, something's weird going on. Two lads, like 15, 16, pulled, like, balaclavas up, hoods up. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? So I went out, what the fuck are you doing? To my neighbour and they were just nicking dust caps stupid they ran off whatever mm. and but my lad was like oh road man dad <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like taking a piss like sort of thing and then uh, I was like well if you were in that situation would you would you have said anything he's like no 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 so, and then uh, he was like oh well I was like do you know how to defend yourself if, if someone was to grab you and they, oh, he's done a little bit of jiu jitsu and then I was like no and then he was watching YouTube and it come up with this bloke that had like got into a fight with someone with jiu jitsu and the guy was like a, a brown belt and he took his back and he was like really calm talking to this guy the whole time, like just calm down, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, my, my lad was like, I just want to know like how to defend myself a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I was just showing him like a little back escape like thing. And then he was like, oh, all right, I'll go, I'll go jujitsu. Mm-hmm. I'll go jujitsu Wednesday. But I just wanted to get him in his head, same sort of thing. Like mm-hmm. you're going to, at some point in your life, especially going to secondary school and as a bloke, you're going to get into some sort of fucking scuffle. Yeah. You've got to know. I think you've got to teach your kids and they've got to know how to yeah, defend yeah. themselves. Yeah. If, I, if I had known some jiu-jitsu or even some sort of striking, I never, I, like I said, I was a fucking fairy playing football all these years. And, uh, you know, I got into loads of fights on and off and it would have been so useful to have some fucking, uh, some actual training. Do you know what I mean? Because, yeah, you know, unless you're bigger than them and they've got no training as well, that's the only way you ever win. And, and all, all the talk of um, sort of not... Um, not being biased or not um, discriminate against people like it, right? Well, you you can you can take that out of the equation straight away to a certain extent by saying, okay, cool. So, if you're gonna, so say you're now, um, say you're walking down the road, okay, right? If you're walking down the road and you're a thirty year old thirty year old female, um, just as I, I was explaining to my wife at the time, like you know why I, why I feel the way I do about it. I was like, if you're a thirty year old female and you're walking down the road, okay, right, and you see a group of um, young women or a group of old women right a group of old women you'd be like that's a group of old women okay cool so now you're walking down the same road same time same group of old women but it's midnight why is is there a group of old women there at midnight it's strange isn't it now you're walking down the same road same time mid uh, you know three o'clock in the afternoon it's a group of old men you'd be like that's a group of old men like you know whatever group of old men there at midnight you're like why is there a group of old men there at midnight and it 
it changes. That's more of a threat now. Mm. So then you're walking down that same road. Um, oh, it's a group of young men or it's two young men. Why are there two young men there, you know, waiting on the side of the road at midnight, you know, and it's in the dark and you're on your own. And, you know, even if, even if it's, you know, me and, you know, like, oh, I'm this big hard bloke or whatever, but, you know, like a sort of fit bloke who can handle himself a little bit. Um, now maybe I can take these two guys, but like, can I cross the road? Is there another way I can go? Mm-hmm. So, so then even, even if I've got the best jujitsu, the best striking, the best crossover of it all, you know, I've got a good brain for self-defense, you know, I can put it all together. Um, if I, if I, before I get there, I go, oh, do you know what? It's been a bit of trouble down there. Why don't I, instead of taking my ego and going, ah, I'm fucking hard now, I'd, no problem, right? I'm walking past these two guys like I don't care, which, and it might kick off or it might not. Okay, right? If I do that and then one of them goes, dickhead. <laughs> if I'm in a bad mood, if I'm in a bad mood, am I not going to react to that and carry on like, like you should, right? Or does my ego go, oh, here we go like justified. Um, so that situation awareness that before you even get yourself in a situation to not put yourself there, take you out of it, but you've, you've got to do a DRA, like a dynamic risk assessment of everything and everybody. And so saying like, everybody's the same and you know, uh, there's no time for, you know, differentiating or discriminating. It, it just doesn't stand up because you have to discriminate at some point, you know, and it, and I know that that's, that's not an excuse for people discriminating against people for, you know, Equal opportunities is a real thing, but equality of outcomes is is like the opposite of equality, isn't it? You know, that's um, that's the opposite of freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. With um, with this kind of attack on masculinity, and in, in you know, for many, it's considered a bit toxic. Do you think that that makes men less or more dangerous if they're less masculine? More dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. More more dangerous to uh, people who are vulnerable less dangerous to dangerous men. Like yeah. the Jordan Peterson quote that everybody's heard now is like, it's so good. And I can't remember where he's got it from. Um, do you know, don't a weak, a weak man isn't a, a weak man, isn't a good man. A weak man's a, a dangerous man, make yourself into a monster mm. and then, you know, learn, learn to be civilized, you know, and well, you, you could say what you like about it. Right. But everybody, every bloke who's got kids mm-hmm. or has got a younger sister or a mum or whatever knows that, um, the same as like, um, you know, mums have this instinct to protect their offspring, you know, and they do. And you hear about all these awesome feats and stuff that, that, um, that these mums do, you know, when their kids are threatened, you know, as blokes, we've got this protect protection instinct that, you know, we'll protect the vulnerable, we'll protect the weak. And, um, that, that's what you do. And it, it winds me up to say like, um, yeah, our oh, toxic mask, isn't he? Because it was that big thing. Or I, like, did you see like the Gillette razor advert? You know, like it was like a video of two kids fighting at a barbecue, and all the blokes are like, <laughs> "For a fight, terrible!" And, and it was like, "Come on, men, you can do better." And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> "I was like, holy shit, I need to shave my beard off." Because like, yeah, men are bastards. I was like, I was like, what are you doing? Like mm. basically saying like, by the way, our whole target demographic. Your bastards, yeah. like you know, yeah, like I don't know why they did that, but um, yes, yeah, so like no, like no, we're not, we're not, we're not having it. Nobody's gonna. Some people are doing it wrong, but I, I think that there's a there's a case for strong men doing manly stuff, and and also like regardless of how everybody else perceives it as well, like I think the people that need to see that. Um, masculinity isn't just a toxic thing or it isn't just being downtrodden by everybody or underappreciated by everybody the people that need to see that are men that are um that are struggling with their their, their mental health mm-hmm. um so that's why I was, I was like right that's who i'm speaking to when i do these posts you know and at, at times as well it can feel a little bit like is you're always a little bit worried that you seem like a bit of a narcissist or you know like uh, oh it's it's all about me or i know all the answers or something but I just think it's important for, for someone to be saying, well, this is what I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that, if that hits home with like one person that goes, oh, do you know what? That's, that's a really good point. I like that. Thanks very much. And it, and it, it generally does. Um, that's enough for me. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what we're doing with cult. Yeah. And no, that's great, mate. Um, just want to talk about, I guess, you know, the, the fact that loads of guys are in a bit of a sticky spot with, with their mental health. Um, we had Andy's man club on recently. Um, and the lead facilitator was giving us statistics and yeah, it's insane. Every two hours, some bloke's committing suicide. Crazy, mate. Or, or sort of taking his own life. It's, 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 a, fucking, it's a fucking scandal, mate. Um, and we just talked a little bit about obviously where we are and, you know, in, in, in the, you know, sort of with the fourth turning and everything else. And it seems like, you know, we are where we are in regard to society at the moment. But what can, what can guys do to try and maybe, you know, sort of improve their physical fitness, 
um, especially sort of slightly uh, more mature gentlemen like ourselves. Um, you know, what, 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 what do you do to stay in shape, mate? Because you're 42, you're not in bad nick. Um, yeah. So what are you doing? What can guys do to try and fucking so, get straight? So uh, before I answer the, the question directly, I'll say one thing that I think people people let slip um and it's like the elephant in the room of it all it's like if there's things you can do to um to advance your situation like financially um and in your relationships then th- those are two things that massively affect us regardless of everything else you know if you if you've got no money and you can't pay your rent then you're gonna feel depressed you know and you know if your relationship shit you know it doesn't matter whether that's with you know your your missus your husband um your mum your dad your siblings or whatever you know that there's a study done by i think I think Harvard, 70 year study where they, um, they did it through generation, generation, generations. Um, they followed their ups and downs, people from really privileged um, backgrounds and people from the gutters and their ups and downs, rich people going to jail, poor people making millions, back down. The one factor that um, contributed most to what's happening was the quality of their relationships. And that's what's really interesting about that is that's why statistically, and this is going to sound mad, um, or it might sound like, complete common sense i don't know but i thought it was, i thought it was really surprising when i first heard it um people down syndrome are the happiest people on the, on the planet statistically because um i think the reason is that they have they only generally have uh, a number of uh relationships in their life but they're really strong relationships like carers siblings parents um and you know maybe a few friends um but they have the, these brilliant relationships that are so happy um so yeah so so um if you can do something to uh, to change your financial situation and to make the relationships in life better, which we all you all do, sort of do ups and downs of that, don't we? Because we, you know, you're focusing on your podcast, or I'm focusing on my brands, or I go away to work or whatever. And today I was packing my bags. I had a puncture which I had to get repaired then, which was going to make me late, and so I didn't have time to sit down with the kids. You know, I give my missus a quick pep before I went, whereas I'd, I'd like to have sat down and had tea with them. Do you know what I mean? I had a chat. And, you know, being more of a husband, being more of a dad in that situation rather than being our dad who's packing his bags to go off for two weeks. So so that's that. Um, that aside, um, for my, I can only speak for myself, what I like doing. Um, so with those two big elephants in the room addressed, um, I need to train. Um, I personally like lifting weights. I think it's probably a side effect of me being a really small, really skinny kid. I didn't like it. Um, so I like having a bit of muscle on. I like being strength. I like being strong. Um, I like pushing weights around. I like how it makes me feel. Um, and uh, and I just get a little bit of a buzz off it and, and I feel good. And so I do that all the time. I should do more cardio, but I hate running. Running is for cowards and Frenchmen and I'll stick with that. Um, I accidentally put a ballot place in for the London Marathon and got in this year. So on my first attempt, so I've got to do the London Marathon in April or whenever it is. Um, I did an ultra marathon once on the coast path. It's like 44 miler. And I only did that because my mate at work is Royal Marine. Um, he said, oh, you went for a run again, did you? I went, yeah. He goes, oh, God. And then the next night I said, oh, I watched a program about um, ultra running. It seemed quite interesting. And he goes, oh, you should have a look at the classic quarter. I was like, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I said, oh, I think I'm going to do that. He goes, you couldn't do it. No, I didn't say anything I was going to do. I, was, I didn't say anything. He goes, you can do it. I was like, yeah, I could. And he's like, no, you couldn't. I said, yeah, I could. He goes, you couldn't do it this year. It's too soon. I was like, I could. And he basically bet me. Before I'd realised what had happened. He's I'd a clever bet- guy, mate. I know. Oh, he's doing <laughs> gold in you. He's an asshole. Tommy, you're an asshole. Um, I basically decided I was going to do an ultra marathon in 10 months. Um, and I did 10 training runs because I used to do one mile three times a week just just to um, burn a bit of body fat for the beach, right? No. <laughs> So for, for a 44 mile ultra, ultra marathon, I did 10 training runs, including the first one miler. Um, I got through it just because I'm stubborn. Um, but yeah, I, I hate running. So, so get your heart rate up, lift some weights, do some cardio, like get, get your heart going. So you're going to feel better on you. Um, I'm a massive believer in um, breath work and um, cold therapy. I think it's awesome. Um, people are like, not people, people are always asking me, ah, oh, um, I get asked quite often, like, what do you do for your, your mental health? What do you do for your physical health? Like, you know, what you seem to be happy quite a lot of the time. Um, I, and I tell them, like, like I train. Um, the other bits we talked about, I said, but I do hot and cold because I've got, um, I got into um, the cold therapy. I got pneumonia just before, about five years ago, just before I joined the fire service. And um, I had pneumonia at work and I was hanging on, so it felt like I was dying. Got some antibiotics, it was better. But coming off that, I was like, right, okay, I need to, because need to, um, I used to get a cold every two or three months. Just nothing bad but sniffles. And I always thought it was kind of like, my nose was always a bit knackered because it's massive. 
and B had broken it like nine or ten times playing rugby and fighting. Um, so deviated septum and all that sort of stuff. I thought, oh, my nose don't work. Anyway, um, I realised that the antibiotics probably nuked my immune system. Someone was telling me, oh, it's crap. So I got into brewing kombucha, which I thought was quite good. Um, and then doing a bit of um, uh, Wim Hof. And I was like, because I used to meditate a lot to, to try and take the edge off my, like, my aggression sort of um, enthusiastic approach to, uh, <laughs> to scrapping. Um, uh, keep me on a bit of a level playing field. And sometimes when you don't want to meditate, it's like when you tell people, I'll oh, meditate and you'll be chilled out. Like if you're not chilled out, it's super hard to meditate. And what, you know, like the saying is like, um, if you don't have time to meditate 20 minutes, meditate for an hour, you know, like, yeah, brilliant. But when you've got like two jobs, a missus, two kids, you know, a job on the side, you're on call with this, whatever. And then you've got, you've got X, Y, and Z going on as well. Like it's so hard, but I got into breath work and I found that when I was doing my breath work every day, I didn't need to meditate because it's like, if you go for a jog, you, know, you go for a jog and all of a sudden the problems that you couldn't get a solution to because you're, you're on a different frequency and you get, you know, it sounds wooey, but you know, you can't solve a problem on the same level that you're trying to, that caused it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you go for a run, you're in a different mindset, you're getting some endorphins. And I, it feels to me like when I'm running, like my head's like, a, you know, like a, the old ice, ice boxes that you stuff on bars with all the ice in it. All the ice is getting jangled around and then like it kind of settles and everything's in its right place. So yeah, anything where, you, where you're with your breath, whether that's, you know, breath work or jogging or whatever it is for you, like go for a walk, I don't know. Um, I find the breath work's really good. And what I noticed with uh, doing the breath work and doing cold showers, which then I got into... I got an ice bath. There's um, a story of that as well. Um, but then I got an infrared sauna as well because I was like, fucking, it's hard. It's hard to get in a garage in the middle of winter in an ice bath that's 1.5 Celsius in a garage. I was like, fucking, it's got to be easy ways of doing this. I was like, ah, I'll get a sauna. I'll stick the sauna next to the ice bath. And so I come in from jujitsu now and I'll, I'll have my sauna on. My missus, bless her, will put it on an hour before I come back get in there 65 celsius in infrared sauna get in there do 20 minutes in there two minutes in the cold and then repeat that three times and i go to bed and i sleep like an absolute baby and the recovery is so much better as well but when i so yeah so breath work cold yeah i reckon that's that's it but i i think it's massive and it will it Declining popularity as well because everybody's into ice baths at the minute, aren't they? Like everybody's got getting a Lumi or whatever, you know, now. Um, so it'll be like great it was in the 70s, you know, and it'll decline as well because at the minute it's cool, but in a, in a minute it's going to be getting into a freezing cold ice bath that no one gives a fuck around on it, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, but the the data of why it works and how it works will still be there. So I just say to any, like anyone, they're, they're like, oh, I feel shit at the minute, I'm struggling a bit, or I'm in stuff, like, you know, what do you reckon? I'm like, do three rounds of Wim Hof um, or other breath work because there's, you know, you've got like your four, seven, eight, which someone I know is having panic attacks at one point and said to me about it. And I said, do a four, seven, eight, four seconds in, uh, hold for seven, exhale for eight. If you do that for over two minutes, your um, your autonomous nervous system goes into, um, goes from par goes from sympathetic, your fight and, fight and flight, to your um, parasympathetic which you rest and recuperate. Mm -hmm. So it's physio physiologically impossible for you to panic at that time. So, and, and that's just making your exhalations, double your inhalations for two minutes. So simple. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it works, you know, and box breathing, you know, something like Navy SEALs are using box breathing now, you know, like, you know, routinely, that's what they teach. So, um, it was gone from this like wooey space where people are going, ah, oh, you know, and they're all sit cross-legged and it, it's like yoga, like say to someone about yoga and there's the images of, oh, you know, doing all the stretching stuff. You know, get with your breath and do some stretching. You know, it's loaded stretching, isn't it? Mm. Uh, how good. So, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in it. And my, so the changes I made were doing a bit more cardio. I did, I did do that at the same time. Um, but doing breath work, doing my cold exposure. Mm. And I went from having a cold every two or three months to in five years, I've had one cold. One cold, one sore throat after we're doing, we're doing um, the, what do you call it? The Marcelatine. Oh, yeah. All right. So I had a sore, <laughs> the I had a sore throat that week, right? Yeah. Funnily enough, but that counts. Um, and I got Omicron at the end um, when I may or may not have been exposed to um, the whole uh, obvious so many times during the whole thing. Yeah, and was absolutely fine. Everyone's going, Christ, are you, are you vaccinated? And I was going, no. 
and they go, what do you do? What are you doing? I was like, do my breath work every day. I do cold therapy, cold water um, immersion every day. And they're going, oh, I don't know. And people, like I said, people say to me, oh, I'm struggling a bit with my, um, my mental physical health. Struggling a bit with my mental health, mate. What do you reckon I should do? I'm like, well, have you got 10 minutes a day? They're like, yeah, cool. I'm like, have you got 15 minutes? They're like, yeah, right, what? I'm like, do do three rounds of uh, breath work, right? And then do one round of cold cold water. And they're like, oh, no, fuck that. I'd like, if I'm feeling shit enough to to speak to someone and say, mate, I'm feeling a bit fucking shit mentally, what do you reckon I should do? If I'm feeling that shit that I'm going to mention it to someone, like, I'm bad, right? So I don't know if that's different with everybody. Maybe people are more proposed, more, you know, used to saying stuff. But if someone said to me, well, it's, compl-, and I say to people, it's completely free and it will take you 15 minutes. And like, try it once. And if you don't like it, don't do it again. Nah, not for me. I'm not getting in the cold. I'm like, all right, cool. Fuck that off. Do the breath work. Nah. It's free, right? And you'll feel better afterwards. Like, th- there's a lot of data there now. It's not just woo. You know, you'll feel better afterwards. You get you get a massive hit of um, norepinephrine, you know, um, how, we, how we make adrenaline in our body. Um, you get a dopamine hit. You will feel better. You, it's the same as, like, going for a jog. You feel better, don't you, afterwards? You lift weights, you feel better. But, um, and I say to people, if you can't be bothered to do that, like, I can't be bothered to try and give you any any more solutions like yeah. how simple is it yeah i just ain't got no time for people like that after a while <laughs> you can help them uh, help them but ask holes they're gonna fucking listen like ask holes <laughs> <laughs> this is a great word isn't it people that they, like or you get a message like oh mate i'm thinking about training but i've had this problem with my shoulder what do you reckon and you go oh, okay cool let me think about it or i'm diabetic or whatever and you go oh, okay cool so you then go away and google like insulin sensitivity and protein and this sort of stuff because i like people go to me ah oh, how can I lose weight or whatever? And I'm like, well, what I do is I just cut my carbs out, you know, like I feel better, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not recommending that. That's what I do. I was like, oh, Christ, how can you do that for your back? So I'd go away, research it for three hours, tell them. Three months later, bump into them. Hi, how are you getting on? Oh, I just didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of my ah. life, mate, as a PT, that is. Yeah. And, <laughs> if you, and if you said, like, when they came to you and, and they said, right, okay, they're like, right, what would you suggest me diet wise? And you're like, just make like one tweak, right? And stick to that. And they would go, I oh, know, I want like a, I want to do like keto or whatever. Do you know what I mean? They want to buy into See, I'm the- really big on like, we're not changing your whole fucking lifestyle yeah. straight away. I, I, when they come to me, I'm like, look, this isn't a fucking 12 week fucking plan. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? This is a lifestyle change. So then I go through and I'm like, right, what food do you eat at the moment? What do you like? What, yeah. do, what don't you like? And then it's just work from that with your calories. Mm-hmm. And then we just cut out shit can you eat this? Yes. Okay. Let's go. There's no excuses now yeah, because you've said you like it. I think people just want a silver bullet half a ton on the main. Yeah. Quick fix. Good done. They do. They, like they want to buy a program or something or a tub that arrives with a shiny sticker on and goes mm. out like you know whatever and it's you yeah, know yeah. it's what, what the yeah. truth though of just hard work a lot yeah. and accountability mainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's massive. Like and and I always I always like. No, not I'm always slagging off Weight Watchers or I'm always slagging off Slimming World, but like, you know, it's, it's easy to like poke, poke fun at them or like, you know, like in the early days of CrossFit, like CrossFit's not going anywhere. It's not, it's not for me, like, but that's just because I can't be asked turning up and doing like group workouts or whatever. I like to train on a train. But the accountability to a peer group and the, and the social support and stuff mm-hmm. is massive in all those things, you know, and that's, that's why, why I think they're really good like you know for all the, the downsides of, of all of them or any of them um, if you're at Slimming World or whatever and do you know what I mean that they bastardise calories and they call it sins which is ridiculous isn't it right <laughs> so like someone sceptical could say that that's so people don't have their own tools to solve their own problems do you know what I mean like yeah we'll call it sins and it's it's in a Cody book and you need to come um, but that peer group accountability that that if I if I'm a fat bastard now and I eat all four of these cakes that I'm meant to have one a day, when I turn up on Friday, everyone's going to know I've been on the cakes. Do you know what I mean? So there, and, there's and, a they, lot. and it becomes competitive, doesn't it? Like we talked with Bish about CrossFit, food, all that. It becomes competitive. If, if me and you're going every week and we both are like, oh, we're going to lose a stone in a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm coming and you're fucking beating me. I'm like, fuck's sake. Mm. You know? And yeah. that's how it is, isn't it? And yeah. That, in people not just men it's and in people that competitive edge yeah. is always there no matter what and in CrossFit like you know the, that whole you know the word lifestyle has come up a few times that, that lifestyle it's the same with jujitsu. the jujitsu lifestyle and you know you can you can poke fun at it and people do poke fun at it as well but the 
community is another another like buzzword that I hate, right? But the jiu-jitsu community is really actually quite cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I've noticed it since I started the soap. Um, people are just like, oh, mate, that's that's wicked. And really nice to see you doing well. And they'll reach out or, mate, I, I've got this mate that does this. Do you want me to put it? Like, oh, yeah, cool. And, you know, like how I've ended up here. That's gone down and had a conversation with someone just to see them about something else you know and then i get chatting with someone and then they get chatting with someone and then it's um i think you get a bit of respect from anyone though who does a martial art jiu-jitsu anything like that yeah. because you know the type of person it's they shared, are shared struggle yeah, making yeah. it is yeah we say yeah. well you said it a load of times yeah, like, yeah and, it, and you do because you you know like if you, you see you see anyone who does it regularly you think fuck it out he's, he's getting smart especially like for me I, I think whenever I see a white belt and they're like a year in I think you've gone through an hard year mate and you, you know what I mean you've yeah, gone yeah. through an hard year you know, it's, <laughs> do you know what I mean it's getting just, smashed weekly is fucking hard to accept but yeah. you've got to get through that first few years yeah. you know, two three years whatever so, it is and, well the whole fucking time but I mean as in those, that first year is fucking you know what I mean? Everyone mm. smashes you. Yeah. It's, it's the same as the ice, ba the ice baths. Like, people look at it, because there is data now, and people look at that as, oh, day to day, day to day. Oh, you only need to do 11, weeks, 11 minutes a week. That's optimal. Right, that's optimal for physiological adaptations, right, and, and um, geeing up your metabolism or whatever. But, you know, if you're then going to go in there for five minutes a day or whatever, you go, ah, oh, it's 50 minutes, is too much. Okay, cool, right, well, it might not be optimal for your, for your adaptations um, physiologically, but... The, the mental strength that that gives you, if you go every day, I get up, and I don't do this every day when I get up because I'm always, I've got different routines and stuff in my way. Um, but if, if I know people that do this, they say every day when I get up, the first thing I do is I go in the ice bath because after that, everything else is easy because you don't want to get out of a nice warm bed and get into a fucking ice bath, do you? I've like, never had No one bath. does. Like, I like to get in there after <laughs> jiu-jitsu. After jiu-jitsu, you know, when your body's screaming, you're like... Doesn't Joe Rogan do that? Doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't he the one who, like, started that? Like, every morning wakes up, gets Mate, in the fucking ice bath. I've got friends that have done it for a month, two months. I've got I've got friends that have done it for, for ages, um, and they swear by it. And, and like, I like it. I, I did a course of... Um, I uh, did a course of hypnotherapy and I never believed in hypnotherapy either. Like, and I never believed in, not that I didn't believe in it, but I, I thought it was all sort of bollocks. And for when I was younger, I'd have said it's for weak people, but I, I went and did like a course of uh, psychotherapy with uh, a guy that I didn't realise at the time was hypnotherapy. So I was sat in there on this, on this Zoom chat in lockdown and I'm like this, like sat in my chair at home and he's trying to hypnotise me. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, for fuck's sake. And I'm like five, five minutes in, like thinking I'm looking like this, like, like this. And I'm sat there like this, like fucking. He goes, Dan, stop, stop, stop. And I, I'm like, what? And he goes, open your eyes, mate. I'm like, all right. He goes, how do you think it's going? I went, uh. He goes, you could be honest, mate. You've got to be honest. And so I went, fucking shit, mate. And he goes, why? I went, because I'm a very sceptical person and a lot of me thinks this is bollocks. And I was like, I know that. You know, like, I contacted you. I want to do this. I said, but that's just it. He goes, no, no, it's cool. We'll just try something else. I was like, all right. And there's me thinking, I've got an hour and 50 minutes of this bollocks, right? And I've got to sit here pretending I'm hypnotized. Next thing, boom. I'm straight in there, like deep, deep, deep. And um, I did another four or five sessions and basically it removed a load of self-limiting beliefs, which is another massive thing that, you know, I've not touched on, but um, self-limiting beliefs and, and um, beliefs that you sort of adopted that were put on you. Like at school, I was, mm -hmm. I was always messing around. I didn't really have the attention span or the inclination to be in school and I don't have an academic intelligence. Um, so I just let people think I was stupid. Um, and I was told I was stupid as well and I was, I was happy with that and it wasn't until you know much later on in my life that I realised that I wasn't stupid and I could do things and um, and it, don't get me wrong that wasn't my parents or my family telling me that either they were all telling me like you're a smart blank you could do a lot better but like all my school reports are class claim <laughs> when I joined the Navy class claim could do better must try harder you know it's all the mm -hmm. same thing um, so yeah did this so did you this think it helped? Of, oh mate it took the brakes off me I felt like so the first one I did was about my relationship with money. And don't get me wrong, I've, I've just spunked a load of money on a new car. Um, so, but that was, that was to incentivize myself to work harder, um, which is a kind of backwards way of doing it. But it's like, yeah, go on, put, put another burden on yourself and pay for it. You know, it's like Robert Kiyosaki and he, when he wanted a Porsche, he was like, don't think about how I'm going to get the Porsche. Get the Porsche and think about how I'm going to get the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> that's not quite where I am with it, but it's, that's kind of what inspired me at the time. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it, it took, it, I felt like um, I'd been dragging an anchor and it was, it was off and I was just like, oh, cool. I was like, started grappling soap. Um, then I was like, oh, why don't I fight again? So I was like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's, let's fight again. Um, what else did I do? 
um cult brand obviously done that uh just the way I approach things as well and you know before maybe I wouldn't have started um cult because it's it's quite hard to stick your neck out sometimes and and sort of put yourself in the firing line of you know um oh you shouldn't be saying that or because and and everything I say with it I'm everything I post with cult I make sure I stop myself before I post it and I go right how could this be taken the wrong way right okay um do I believe in what I've said yes is a could I say it better? Probably, but you can't you can't just procrastinate and re-edit everything. You've got to put something out there at some point. Do I stand by it? And would I would I be willing to explain myself to someone who's got an opposing view? Yes. Do I think it needs saying? Yes. Right. I'm going to say it. And and so maybe I wouldn't have bothered before that, but I was like, right, like fuck it. I'm I'm being I'm being me. I'm doing what I think I need to do, what I should do uh, to make my life better, my family's life better, um, and to be a better bloke. And, and that's kind of where I'm at. Mate, it's, like, it's crazy. And like have, you, have, you, have you ever seen a hypnotist? Have you ever, like... Th- I'd never believed in it. And this is... So I've got a really fucking weird story, right? Just quickly. I went to Benidorm on a stag do years ago, right? <laughs> For the fucking places. Right, so we're fucking... <laughs> anyone who's been Benidorm, they were going down fucking in the Red Lion pub, right? So, um, actually, it's my father-in-law stag doing. And he's got all his older mates. So there's a bloke called, called Nick. And he's fucking minted, right? Lovely bloke, minted, bit bit stern, like, like you know, like you were saying, like don't believe anything. Anyway, going past this pub, there's a fucking hypnotist in the pub, right? So he's going around and he's picking people out of the crowd, right? And he goes over to Nick, and it's like the worst person that you could have gone to because he's like fuck off, like sort of thing. He's like, nah, nah, come on, come. On. Eventually, we fucking goad him to get him on stage. So he goes on stage, and I'm there thinking, this ain't gonna fucking work. Like I've never seen a hypnotist, never believed it. He got, <laughs> he got Nick to fucking be scared of this like puppet bird right at the first right like a fucking puppet bird right gets worse then he's like right nick you're a you're a japanese singer called tommy yakamoto and he's like oh yeah and he starts speaking Jap. there's nowhere to like gets on stage like on stage stood up gets gives him a mic he starts talking japanese to the crowd laughing going ha ah, like in it's japanese accent no way no word of a lie walking around sang a japanese song the whole fucking... Th- uh, and you can't make it up, right? Yeah. The whole fucking thing. And there was another lad, and he was a big boy. Big boy. So he was really conscious, kept fucking pulling his T-shirt and all that sort of stuff. And he was doing the same sort of thing to him, but he made him think he was Britney Spears. Right? So he's gone on, and he's, he's basically stripped down to his boxes. The, the fucking hypnotist got him stripped down to his boxes. Big boy, like, really conscious, you can see it. Hit, doing Britney, Britney Spears, hit me baby one time, and just woke him up halfway like literally towards the end oh he God. stood there and he's just gone oh my fucking god the pub is rammed and then on that i was like they could do fucking anything to you mm. like do you know what i mean like yeah that's fucking powerful isn't it Mate. you know what i mean like he, he was getting he was thinking that he was talking japanese <clears throat> yeah. and then you speak to nick after i was like can you remember it he's like mate I can't. he's like i can vividly remember bits and pieces but i you know, it's only because we recorded it and showed it back to him. Yeah. He was like, "How?" Yeah, I've never, I've never, crazy. yeah, I've, I've never done that, that sort was, of shit. That, that was in Benetton. <laughs> yeah, the, when when it, the state I was in, I was explained to me is like they just make you more acceptable su- to suggestion and relaxed, and so you can sort of be honest about things, and and that's where I was with it. Oh, um, they thought he was giving bath as well. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> they, made, they made him believe, and I had to go we, on we, stage. We've already, said, we, we've already had that conversation. Yeah, and we had to go on stage mate. and just fucking. <laughs> Like pretend that he was giving birth to this baby. Oh mate, it's, it's funny as well. well. We we um so when I was in the navy, we we're out in the uh, Western Indies and Caribbean. The army were like, uh, we we're in like Belize. They were like, oh, do you want to come do some like jungle survival? We're like, yeah, cool. So we went and did. We was, it was all happened. We slept in these like shelters and it was minging. And then so the next day we we're up having some chicken and we like slaughtered this pig to eat. That's cooking. We got the chicken. They're like, right, so you sort chickens out yourselves. So I was like, okay, cool. And, I was, I, had a bad, I was in a bad mood then. I didn't even sleep and I was hungry. So I was like, I'll go and wash your chickens in the river just to get some time on my own. Completely forgot about the brief we'd had about don't go down to the river on your own um, in it because there's crocodiles, right? And they attack the local fishermen sometimes. Like, ah. So I'm, I forget about this. I've got four chickens, so I get it freshly slaughtered. But just before this, they'd shown us how to hypnotise the chickens. And it, like, so you get the chicken, you hold it down like that with your, your finger on its head like that. And you go along and you just sort of stroke it like that. And you come slower and longer. You just keep doing that. And then eventually, you can take your hand away. And the chicken's just there. Burp, 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 hypnotized. <laughs> so that's why I learned. Anyway, I told my mates about this. And they never believed me. About 15 years later, we're on a stag do. 
found a chicken. <laughs> Hypnotise his chickens. <laughs> <laughs> found the chicken as you do on the table. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking Cornwall, mate, innit? No, that was like... <laughs> doing a wheelchair like after, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so we, found, we had this chicken in the hot tub with us. It was cool. The chicken loved it. Um, you had a chicken in yeah, the hot tub? Yeah, Jemima. Oh, Jemima the chicken. Um, yeah, he's having a great time. And um, Hypnotise his chicken. We're just in this kitchen, like, you know, having this party and there's a chicken there. Quite happy. Um, but yeah, so I went down to the river and I'm washing, I'm washing these chickens off and there's like a little bit of sort of a blood, blood trail, blood and sort of oil and stuff on the surface and I see fish sort of turning up and I love fish, right? So I'm like, ah, oh, cool fish. So I was like, if I go back, go out a bit deeper, I can see some bigger fish. I go out a bit deeper. Anyway, I end up about hundred meters into this massively wide river in Belize. It's about sort of, I don't know, just below my chest depth and I'm sat on this rock flowing scraps to like bigger and bigger fish with this slick of oil and blood going down the river and then one of the boys comes out he's like he's having a wee in the river he's like yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm like oh, I didn't hear that he's like yeah, blah, blah. I was like I don't know what he's saying then I worked out on the third shout that he's shouting oh you're not afraid of the crocs then Bertie someone called me Bertie Bassett oh fuck crocodiles I forgot about them so, but by the time I realised what he's saying I was like nah give me a fuck about crocodiles mate from St Ives so I massively bluffed it and I'm like Please go, please go. As soon as he went out of view, I'm like just scrambling out <laughs> this river before the crocodiles oh, get me. Yeah, so that was where I learned to hypnotize chickens. So like, I had this idea that well, if you could hypnotize a chicken, then we're just a more complex machine, aren't we? So, mate, it changed my view completely because out of everyone, I was like, no way they're going yeah. there. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean, no way. There's no way you would next. go along with yeah, that. He, that. That's yeah. the thing. You would never in a million years if they were. Bullshitting, mm. he'd have gone. Well, that's like, have you seen like, uh, like Vinnie Shawman who works with um, Liam Harrison? No. Liam Harrison, the the kickboxer or Muay Thai fighter, yeah. should say, um, really good British fighter. Um, he works with a guy called Vinnie Shawman. Um, he's a mega nice guy, but he does like hypnotherapy with him, and they have like a keyword of him that's like warrior. And like, you know, if Vinnie's in his corner and stuff, and he's fighting, he says warrior, warrior, and like he puts him into this headspace. Yeah, it's, it, it's so, mate, even like when you take like the hypnotherapy side out of it and you just talk about your narrative, you know, the way that you speak to yourself and it, and it like that sounds like the most wooey bollocks, you know, mental healthy type nonsense you've ever heard. Right. But if you're if you're sitting there with your shoulders down, looking at the floor, thinking oh, I'm such a fucking such a dickhead because I've not done this, this and this, you know, like that's so crap. You're telling yourself this narrative all the time. I'm such an idiot, or I'm a bad husband, or I'm a bad father, or whatever. Oh, I've got all these failings. I'm so terrible. You know the way you talk to yourself is so big. You know, if, and if you like, go, okay, cool, right. Well, tomorrow I'm gonna I'm gonna start with one thing that I need to I need need one win first off. So make your bed, whatever it is. You know, then I need my two I need my two wins like that Tim Ferriss thing, isn't it? From your four hour work week or whatever it is. I have two things that you're gonna do today. Not a list of ten things to do that you might do two of them. Two things that you need to do, prioritise them and get them done. And it, they're non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, cool, I got out of bed, I got that one win. I had the right breakfast that I was meant to have. You know, I did whatever else my morning routine is, got to work on time, whatever it is. Then I got those two things done. And you'll feel so much better about yourself. So, mm -hmm. so you know, even about like talking about hypnotherapy or whatever, it's like the, the headspace you're putting yourself in or setting yourself up for success or your small wins or whatever mm -hmm. and letting them lead on to bigger wins. And uh, don't get me wrong, like I do it all the time, like, the other day, my missus came home, missus was working. Uh, she came home, uh, school holidays, obviously, isn't it? So she came home, she went, all right. I went, yeah. She goes, what's up? I was like, no, nothing. No, I'm good. I've had a lovely day. She goes, do you need to go to the gym? I was like, yeah. And then what I'd done was I drank coffee all day because I'd, I'd met a friend for a breakfast and a meeting with him. And then um, I'd laid a family pop round. Then I had another mate pop round. And then I had family pop round again. Um, so I drank coffee all day without a plan, right? If I drink coffee without a plan... I just sit there and procrastinate all day. So it's like, it's my one, one of my like rules that, that I got that I know would be good is make sure I've trained, right? I feel better if I do some cardio. I need to make that like a, a non-negotiable as well, really. But I hate running and I like, I love like my cardio to be jujitsu. So that's, that's where I am with that really. Um, but yeah, make sure I've got a plan, then caffeinate. Because otherwise I'll sit there thinking about whether to do back and buys or chest and tries, like, you know, and, and I won't get anywhere. And then, I was an hour and a half late. It had gone from three, three o'clock to half past four and I was still in the house. And my missus said to me, are you still here? And I was like, yep. I, I had a coffee and I sat there and she put some funny cat videos on. We were sat there with our nine-year-old daughter watching funny animal videos on Instagram. And all of a sudden it's an hour and a half later. I'm now like, I've now only got two hours before I've got to go fire brigade drill in which to train. I'm like, oh, now I can't have a, 
now I can't have a sauna and an ice bath or do cardio. I'm like, which one do I do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, but, so I know that about myself. So as well, like when I look at people and it's so easy to look at people and go, ah, oh, like the, the really obvious one is the fat person that can't lose weight. And you go, ah, oh, listen, mate, it's calories in, calories out, right? It's, it's so simple. And, it, like, and that thing with that is, it's simple, but it's not easy. Do you know what I mean? Something that's simple doesn't mean it's easy, does it? But you can go, this would make things so much, so much clearer for you, so much more obvious. Why can't you do that? But then I look at, I look at myself and I go, well, why don't I have £100,000 in the bank saved up from the last, like, three years or four years or ten years or whatever it is? It's because I don't take the, I don't take the advice that someone who's, like, f- more financially literate or more financially disciplined would give me. Just because I find it easy to manipulate my own body weight, you know, my own fitness levels. And it's, for me, it's just a case of doing it. Like, do it. Do more, eat less. You know, for, for me, I go, oh, okay, cool. I'd like, to be a li- I'd like to be a bit leaner. All right, cool. Well, I'll eat less cakes. Do you know what I mean? Or I'll cut out carbs or whatever it is. I won't have chips. For me, that's really easy. But then, like, for me to, like, watch my money was a massively hard thing. And I had to go and see a psychotherapist for that, you know, and a coaching psychologist or whatever he's called. And, and do it that way. So... It's, it's kind of a little bit humbling for me sometimes when I, because you can, you can go into like your little sort of armchair, like, all right, well, if you want to lose weight, just stop eating so much. Mm. But then it's like saying to me, like, oh, all right, where's all your money? It's just, yeah. it's just different addictions. It's, it's food addiction's a real thing, like yeah, yeah, breaking yeah. those habits. And like you said, if you, was, if you was a bit shit with money, it's breaking that habit of, oh, I've got a bit of money here, I'm going to go and buy a fucking. And the next. Na- the narrative got, you know just for that little bit of a so, orphan spike you know so I've had a shit day I've had a shit week or whatever I'm going to go treat and buy myself. treat myself I'm going to go and treat myself I've had a shit day I'm going to go and treat myself to a McDonald's but yeah that's exactly it that's it's the it. same and, and thing we do it throughout society yeah yeah, yeah. and, and, and every not everybody some, some people maybe they've got the perfect life and they do everything perfectly um, not me uh, I know that but that's what that's why it's quite humbling sometimes to think of that and to try and look at it objectively and, and take the the ism or the whatever out of it and go okay cool right well you know i can manipulate my weight loss really easily maybe i could help people with that maybe i have to change my mindset a little bit to help people with that or change how i say things but the same thing that's true of them with their eating is true of me with my it might be spending or it might be investing or it might be saving or whatever else it is everyone has a thing mate yeah everyone of course they do of course they do thing, yeah mate good advice there mate lots of it Give us a give us a shameless plug, mate, and we'll let you get on the road. Shameless plug, so cultbranduk um, dot com, grappler soap, no, mrbassett's.com. So if you've got if you've got some skin issues, uh, eczema, psoriasis, sensitive skin, itchy, dry skin, uh, all that bad stuff, um, or you want to stay free of um, staff and ringworm on the mats, um, get some of that in your life. Absolutely, it comes recommended. Yeah, I know. Go check out his shit. Awesome, yeah. mate. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.